uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar and to have our opening remark of the webinar. I'd like to invite Mr. Suresh Dimel, the chairman and CEO of the Export Development Board. Hi, Yubovan. I cordially welcome the foreign and local professors, lecturers, heads of institutions, industry members, and all other participants who have joined today for this awareness webinar on the marine and offshore industry. The EDB has identified the marine and offshore engineering sector as one of the emerging export services sectors for the country. Sri Lanka is blessed with several competitive advantages compared to other countries in the region. Sri Lanka's strategic location and the absence of a marine hub between Dubai and Singapore are the key factors for the development of this sector. Strongly positioning ourselves for future opportunities is the need of the day. We also need to prepare our talent pool to cater to this international demand. As the apex body to develop and promote exports, EDB expects to raise awareness on current developments in the marine and offshore engineering sector, fill the gaps of skills and competencies required for the industry and available opportunities of the sector. Also, this webinar is mainly intended for academics, graduates, undergraduates, and any other enthusiasts in the marine and offshore sector. Wish you all a fruitful discussion ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Dr. Indrajit, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Me. Yeah. Thank you for that opening remarks. Uh, let me first uh, share my slide. Okay, I hope you can see my slides now. Yes. Okay, uh, uh, good afternoon to all of you. And I'd like to welcome you all to the webinar on the paradigm shift of marine and offshore industry by improving its skill and capacities. Uh, this is the inaugural webinar series of 2021 organized by the subcommittee on skill development in marine and offshore sector under the Export Development Board. I'm Indrajit Nishankar, Senior Lecturer from the Department of Mechanical Engineering, the University of Maratur. I'm currently serves as the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Skill Development in Marine and Offshore Sector under EDB. And I would also be the moderator for the today's webinar. So this webinar is aimed to provide the knowledge of the current development of marine and offshore industry, its potential opportunities, and more importantly, how we can improve skills, capacities of our workforce. It is also aimed to encourage a discussion between academia and the industry to encourage Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan university and technical education institutes to develop programs to cater to these industry requirements. We have an interesting uh, presentation lineup today and also an expert panel who would share their expertise, knowledge and experience. So let me go through our partners for this webinar. The Export Development Board, who is actually hosting the event. And then we have local university academics, the foreign ex exports on export, the offshore engineering sector, and then a local leading local industries, including Dockyard, Haley's Energy, uh, GAC Walkers, and so on. So when you talk about the marine and offshore market segment, which is focused on catering to the demand for ship repair and ship building, oil and gas rig building repair, servicing and offloading, offshore engineering, oil field equipment, manufacturing and servicing, and uh, catering to the marine and, marine and engineering services for the offshore support vessels and assets. And also it includes marine engineering constructions. So it's a, a vast field that we are looking at. And as we know, and also our chairman has already explained, Sri Lanka is located in a strategic location in the maritime industry, which is why this industry is much important. 
the fact that there is no service provider between Singapore and Dubai makes Sri Lanka location advantages. Also, the natural inner anchoring facilities in Dwinko Harbor makes it an ideal location for layups of rigs and FPSOs. And we know that daily 200 to 250 ships passed in this route, hence if we can attract the fraction of these ships for servicing purposes would be beneficial for the country and the local industry. Moreover, we have an industry which is capable of handling almost all the service related to the maritime industry. However, uh, still uh, we need to develop the skills and capacities of the potential workforce. That is one of the, the key focus areas of this webinar. Um, in the Sri Lankan marine and offshore sector, current focus is mainly towards the, uh, the shipbuilding and repair. We have a world-class ship repair facilities like a dockyard or walkers. And now the industries like Haley's Energy, dockyard gas workers, they are already providing layups, repairs, and other services to oil and gas rigs and other offshore assets as well. So we also have an uh, industry for smaller ship and boat building. So more details of these uh, industry segment will be discussed by our speakers today. So looking at the future, the cold and hot FPSO layup facilities at Trinko and Hambantota can be built up to a world-class uh, service provider. Also, the recent discoveries of natural gas in Manakori and its explorations and production will generate uh, many potential opportunities for of the offshore sector. The proposed LNG FSRU unit at Colombo Harbor and underwater pipelines will demand many new competencies in the sector. On the other hand, the offshore or renewable energy generation in the form of wind energy or solar energy or wave energy will open new possibilities. The ocean resource development and moving into a blue economy requires more skills and capacities to be developed in this sector. So that's another focus that we are trying to give in this webinar. In terms of the oil and gas industry, it can be mainly divided into uh, three phases, upstream, midstream, and downstream where you need a different knowledge and skill sets to handle these operations, which I'm sure our speakers will discuss in detail. Also providing services to these three processes would be another avenue for our local industry. So there are key limitations that we identify in the, in the local industry to cater for these lucrative markets. Hence our subcommittee, the focus is on ad addressing these issues by developing the capacities of our workforce to cater to the local industry. Further, there are potential opportunities that uh, in the countries like Singapore or Dubai, where we can supply skilled workforce as they are mainly depend on the, the foreign skilled workforce at the moment. Hence, we are planning to develop a discussion with a local university to upgrade or introduce a new programs or courses required to present the marine and offshore engineering sector. Uh, the building the skills and development programs to meet the standard of the marine and offshore engineering sector, which is very important for further development of this industry. In the skill development, we have identified three distinct education levels to be developed. The postgraduate training programs to develop capacities of the work engineering, working engineering forces. The development of uh, joint PG programs with uh, foreign universities will be a good way to move in this direction, we can take the help of foreign renowned universities and by developing joint programs, research and signing MOUs. Also, we can invite experts who have been in this industry for a longer durations to help in developing these programs. I believe the uh, follow-up webinar series will help to build this link. Adding uh, courses to existing engineering programs and developing new uh, programs in the engineering faculties and also in the technology faculties. And finally, the vocational education, such as welding, uh, blasting, scaffolding, that could be another area that needs improvements to cater to this industry. So without taking further time, let me now brief you the webinar layout. Uh, our speaker in the first sessions will discuss the oil and gas industry, the journey from 2009 and how we could 
also, and how we could learn from the global experience. Then the second session will discuss the recent developments in oil and gas exploration in Sri Lanka. After the both these sessions, we'll have a Q&A time for you to get any further clarifications. Uh, you can direct your questions to the chat while the sessions are going on, and we will take them in a designation Q&A session. I know that the uh, interesting lineup of talks will bring out many questions. We will try and answer as much as we can. The third sessions will discuss the design technologies, installation and the maintenance of marine structure, while the last session will uh, a brief about the environmental aspects and the renewable energy developments, and which will be followed by a final Q&A sessions and the concluding remarks. Right. Uh, so then uh, without taking further time, uh, I would like to thank you all for joining today's webinar. And uh, let me introduce the two speakers for the first sessions to begin the proceedings of the webinar. So let me again uh, share my screen. Okay, uh, hope you can again see my screen. So our first speaker for the session is the board director, Haley's Energy Services Lanka Private Limited. He is currently functioning as a head of Haley's Energy Division, a driving projects uh, related to oil and gas, LNG and renewables in Sri Lanka and overseas. He has a vast experience in managing complex projects covering oil and gas industry, SCM and logistics, aviation, at travel and tourism, FMCG, and tech services in last 20 years in UK and Sri Lanka. He obtained a bachelor's degree from London, Graduate School of Management, MBA from Buckinghamshire University, UK. He is also a fellow FCIM and a chartered member of a Chartered Institute of Marketing, UK, and a chartered member of Institute of Logistics and Transport. He is a recipient of several awards, including Leadership Award for Haley's Group, uh, the service excellence in uh, going beyond call for duty and success story about for new business conceptualizing to implementation. He is currently serving as a member of EDB Advisory Committee on Marine and Offshore Engineering and a member of Subcommittee on Skill Development. Today, he will talk about uh, the Sri Lankan oil and gas journey from 2009. So please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Ricky Barnett. And uh, then uh, the session, first session, we have uh, another speaker. And he is an independent consultant in oil and gas industry and the rena renewable energy sector. He got his PhD from Norwegian University of Science and Technology, NTNU, and has specialized in geological technologies for subsurface modeling and delineation of oil, offshore oil and gas reserves. He has experience in data processing, interpretation and consultation services, and later in the operational sector. Also, he has more than 30 years of experience in the oil and gas exploration and production business from Norwegian Continental Shelf. He is a certified project manager in Prince 2 system, and also holds several years of experience in managing multidisciplinary projects for the oil and gas industry. In today's webinar, he's going to tell us about the oil and gas exploration and how we can learn from the global oil and gas experience. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Kapil Edirivira. So over to you, Mr. Barnett and Dr. Edirivira. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me start with sharing my screen, please. Can someone confirm the screen is visible? Yeah, we can see the screen. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone um, in Sri Lanka and good morning to my friends from Europe. And thank you, VDB, for the opportunity given today, uh, especially to um, give a snapshot of the last decade. Um, as a person who was involved on the day one since the war ended in 2009, uh, we started on the exploration project in Sri Lanka. 
So um, from joining as a manager in 2009, up to date, I'm involved in the Sri Lankan oil and gas industry. So thank you for the opportunity to giving, uh, for allowing me to speak a few words and run you, take you through this journey. Um, so to get orientated, uh, let's look at the petroleum industry. I know Dr. Nisanka touched briefly about what it is, um, but we are talking about the EMP sector, the exploration and production sector. Uh, the gasoline, the diesel that we use, the plastics out there, uh, the fertilizer, the asphalt that is on the road, all this needs a source. So the journey starts with upstream, where we go out there and look for oil and gas. And then we bring that out um, transport them and then get them out of the system to process and come up with the products that we need. So this entire industry is segmented, this journey is segmented into mainly as upstream where we look for oil and gas, midstream and then downstream. Out of this large industry, you will note that Sri Lanka today is a 100% importing country. Unfortunately, we have not been able to bring anything uh, from our sources. Is it because we don't have oil and gas in Sri Lanka? No, that has changed. We didn't have the required resources, the skill sets, the people, and the backing to bring this uh, important resource out. So we are now 100% dependent on importation of all these products. But things started to change in 2009. We started the journey. Uh, back of our minds, uh, the uh, previous experts knew that there is resources in this in these basins as per the geology. And in 2009, the journey started. We started after the war. Um, I just want to bring uh, a point here on, on the why this has always started and stopped. And again, again started when regime changes and again it stopped. The oil and gas EMP side, if you take the life cycle on this slide as I show you, Exploration typically takes at least between five to eight years. So once you find the oil and gas, you need to develop the field. That will take at least another three to five years. And then depending on the size of the reservoir, you, its life cycle can go up to 10 to 30 years. And then once you've run out of the resource, then you need to abandon, abandon it safely and environmental friendly. So that will take another three years three to five years. So if you take the complete EMP business life cycle, it's a 30 year horizon. So when governments change every five years, we start to lose focus. So this is this understanding that now everyone has got into uh, with the support of EDV and many other government institutions. We, with PRDs as heavy uh, push, I think things are starting to move in the right direction now. What you see on the left-hand side is the um, oil and gas map. Uh, I will show you a new map that the PRDS has launched. You will see um, three colored areas, yellow, um, pink, and uh, orange. Uh, on the north side of Sri Lanka is the shallow water blocks um, in yellow. And then on the west coast side, Mana, Colombo, that side is the Mana Basin and the Lanka Basin on the east coast side. So you can see Sri Lanka is surrounded uh, with oil and gas uh, blocks. Uh, technical details will be shared by Prini and Madam Prini when she is doing her presentation. So this journey to bring out our oil and gas, our own hydrocarbons, was initiated with uh, Kane Energy winning the tenders uh, back then. They entered into a petroleum resources agreement in uh, uh, 2008, and they commenced the exploration project. So in 2009, we started the first seismic survey to look for oil and gas in the Mana Basin. And with the studies, successful studies, um, they decided to go ahead and drill for three wells um, using a Japanese drilling ship, drill ship called Chikyu, which came over here and drilled three wells, namely Dorado, Barracuda, and Dorado North. Very fortunately, we managed to discover hydrocarbons. So that established that Sri Lanka is a country with a working petroleum system. So we are actually thankful for Keynes for proving to proving for the proving to the world that Sri Lanka is a country that possesses a working petroleum system. With Dorado and Barracuda uh, showing gas and condensate discoveries, it was left to the uh, government and authorities and the operator to decide how to monetize this. 
they went, they didn't stop there. They decided to go into the next phase and then went ahead, did another seismic and drill for the fourth well, of course, to understand more geology and the basic characteristics. Fourth well, of course, turned out dry. Uh, it, it showed signs of um, good quality uh, reservoir sands, but it had to be abandoned. By that time, we were entering uh, to the last stages of the project. And then um, the government, the operator, we all had to decide on whether the discoveries can be commercialized, whether it is commercially attractive, can it be monetized? Unfortunately, at that time, the crash of oil prices and various other technical reasons, uh, things couldn't work out very well. So Keynes decided to exit. So after eight years, uh, starting from 2008, by 2016, Kane Energy left Sri Lanka. You can see on the map, um, on the bottom side, uh, middle, you can see uh, the block map of uh, Mana Basin Block 2, the distance of uh, Barracuda and Dorado to the shoreline. Barracuda is, of course, 66 kilometers away from the shoreline of Mana. So you can see, and the water depths are about four kilometers. So it, it's not an easy task. It's highly cost intensive. So there had to be a good commercial model for the operator and the government to decide on going ahead. But best point, the best point that we got is we approved, we proved that there is a working petroleum system in the country. Going further from there, these are the two uh, discovery notes. Um, I thought I'll share with you uh, the two when you hit a discovery, the operator notifies that they have made a discovery. On the left-hand side is the letter confirming the discovery of Dorado, um, where they went for a depth of 1,354 meters. And on the right-hand side, where they encountered the discovery in Barracuda well, uh, going to a, a total depth of 4,741 meters. With this, I will show you some pictures, some taken by me, uh, uh, some from the projects. Uh, that's an uh, aerial shot from the helicopter. Um, the best part was there that the entire air logistics, because as you saw in the previous map, this is offshore, um, quite far away from the shoreline. So every person who works out there on the drill ships or the seismic vessels had to be moved by air logistics. They have to take a helicopter to the rig. And the helicopters are operated completely by Sri Lankan Air Force, very talented pilots who uh, flew onto these rigs and seismic vessels and landed safely and brought the people back. Um, so the 2009 seismic that we did with CGG Veritas, and then in 2010, uh, for one year, a um, company called Fugro got involved in doing the mid ocean studies. And with those studies, they went ahead uh, to do the drilling with uh, Japan's, Japan, JDC's Chiku drilling drill ship. Further, they didn't stop. In 2012, uh, 12, again, PGS got involved to do the seismic studies. And then Transocean's um, drill ship came for the next drilling campaign. Then from there, we had a little bit of a pause after Keynes exit uh, uh, with our uh, fellow company, uh, GAC. Uh, BJP Pioneer was involved uh, to do another further seismic around the country. And now, as you saw in news, ready news, um, PRDS has initiated the multi-client airborne gravity magnetic study in the Kaveri Basin that's way in the north. Uh, this is an area that uh, you cannot send a boat, so it's uh, they are using the best technology to gauge uh, the characteristics of that block. So this vast industry requires really good, high-skilled, multidisciplinary teams from good project managers, uh, people who know geology well, geochemists, petrophysicists, various type of commercial analysts. We need all of them. So this small industry that you see on the slides is actually huge. You see the disciplines that it can attract, unlike uh, doing lo a logistics project, oil and gas, EMP activities, calls for various types of disciplines. And the EDB with this initiation uh, to bring out the skill set to prepare us, uh, it was a very good timely move. So when Keynes exited in 2016 and uh, we really didn't have a push uh, of the industry to recommence any exploration and production activities we had a choice to make whether we are going to close shop close the business or we continue and find new ways to work with so as edp chairman mentioned 
uh, during his uh, speech at the beginning. There is opportunity between Dubai to Singapore. There is no proper hub, marine hub. So we thought, oh, let's make use of this location. So we looked at the rigs, what comes to India. India has a huge drilling program. They have a very aggressive exploration campaign going on. So we managed to go speak to these operators and get their assets to come and park here, which we call today as a layup project. So all these assets, what you see on screen, uh, the left was our first rig that came here in 2017, all India star. You can see it's a, a, a rig on a ship, one of the first that, uh, projects that we did in Sri Lanka. And then the other rigs, uh, drill ships, Aban Abraham, Durubai one, as uh, Dr. Nis uh, Indeljit mentioned, is about 300 meters in length. Uh, the only FPSO and largest FPSO in Sri Lanka right now, she's at Trinkamal if you want to take a look. And the other drill ships, the latest drill ships, West Polaris and Karina, which is at the Hambantar port, and the other marine assets in Trincomalee. So we managed to attract these and make Sri Lanka still be in the oil and gas business. So the whole world knows Sri Lanka is still there doing technical services. We do a lot of engineering work, logistic work on these rigs and keep the country's flag still flying high in this domain. Not only that, if you see right at the bottom left, uh, there is a, a rig on a yard that's a land hydraulic workover rig, which was converted with the assistance uh, of our good partners, Dockyard, uh, to a snubber and exported to Bangladesh for a drilling campaign there. That again, we did it in Sri Lanka. And on the middle, you can see a girl on a screen doing some drawings. This is our technical drawing division, which we started 10 years ago. Today, we have about 10 to 12 people working as a BPO doing oil and gas drawings, engineering drafting services. We do, we clock about 500 to 750 hours a month, and we do all this for the North Sea oil and gas assets. Further going from there, we have managed to establish a downhole tools logistics center. Uh, the right bottom right corner picture is all downhole tools that is used at the well. We, we managed to convince a, a company to open their hub in Sri Lanka. So from as a hub, Sri Lanka is able to send all these tools to various uh, oil fields. So we operate this. So though the EMP activities had a pause, we managed to keep this going. So today is a culmination where again, PRDS uh, with the government support is trying to restart the industry aggressively. We have built up industry, we have good partners and uh, fellow workers from GAC, the dockyards, the walkers, and various other people to uh, really support the industry to build it, to stay this entire journey of 30 to 40 years. So talking about opportunities, um, we are launching, launched to search for new prospects in the North Basin. The old map where Mana, Kaveri and Lanka Basin was mapped out and surveyed has been changed to have small attractive blocks. So anyone who wants to bid for a block, they can go for smaller blocks there than putting money for a large acreage. And we again hope that like what we did in old days, we had these two young graduates from University of Morotua, Geetika and Sahan working for us as interns. We would like to open it up as the industry commences to many more uh, young graduates from University of Morotua and various other universities to come and join us and work with us and get this industry moving in the right direction. So at this uh, young Sri Lankan army soldier, injured soldier went out there and win a Paralympic gold medal for the country. He had a lot of passion in himself and passion led him there. And of course we need luck. Uh, we can have everything going, but luck also has to favor. So with my ending note, I want to quote Roman philosopher Seneca's words, Luck is when opportunity meets preparation. So today's session is also about preparation. We are trying to prepare the academics and everyone around us to give a really good support to recommence this industry. Thank you very much. May I call Dr. Kapila to continue the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Right, uh, thanks, Ariki. I hope everybody uh, can see my screen now. Hello. Yes, we can. Yeah, we can see. 
Okay, great. Hello. All right, this is, uh, I'm actually uh, joining from Norway. Um, thank Ricky updating uh, the current situation. I think I'll uh, switch off my video. It was, uh, was probably uh, better. Um, right, I actually uh, slightly modify my title, Development of Petroleum Reserves in Sri Lanka, Implementation of Technology and Building Competency is actually what uh, Ricky said as well. So we need actually competent staff to work on the reserves. And of course, we found the uh, gas columns um, um, in, in, in a couple of wells. I think we need to do evaluation and once evaluation is done, so probably we'll find some investors to work on. Let me start my uh, speech. Uh, the next slide. Um, my presentation is actually uh, covering all the three major units, understanding the offshore oil and gas ENP life cycle, and then uh, it goes to technology related to oil and gas industry, what we have been doing here 30 years uh, in my uh, past uh, in the industry. In, in Norway, it's about 50 years of uh, oil and gas experience. I actually catch up some of the uh, information for you today to, uh, to summarize exactly what uh, technology is required. Um, the synergy between university research and industry is actually one of the things that I would like the industry people and the university staff to know exactly what can be done uh, creating the uh, um, lot of uh, energy together to, to bring up the industry forward. Let's see. Um, Understanding the oil and gas uh, ENP life cycle. So before that, I would like to differentiate what is actually onshore and what is offshore because uh, none of our participants uh, ever seen any oil industry activities and we don't have onshore oil in Sri Lanka. But uh, I would like to, uh, to pay attention to exactly what is onshore operation. So onshore operation is actually land basis. You see some uh, couple of... Uh, um, slides down there. So if I actually put the uh, pointer here, with the land crew somewhere in the US. So the direct access to the formation being at the rig. So you see that the uh, the rig is actually on land. So the uh, the bell is actually uh, penetrating right behind below the uh, platform. Easy to transport equipment and personnel because it's a land base. It's uh, just uh, uh, driving to the, the location. Easy to manage safety and security. In a disaster mitigation system, so it's on land, much easier to access all the location and the personnel. Low overall production cost is roughly around $10 a unit, uh, either gas or oil. So it's much easier to operate like in the Middle East and South, uh, Saudi Arabia and so on. So the much cheaper to uh, extract oil from, from land. But in offshore case, uh, definitely it's a different issue. No direct access to the formation beneath the uh, beneath the uh, rig due to see water column. Devices, uh, tools, and personal transportation is an issue. So you need to have a, a boat or a helicopter roughly around two hours uh, from land to the uh, platform. It costly as well, additional cost. Safety and security is a major threat. Disaster is mitigation requires additional tools and uh, um, resources. High overall production cost is, uh, is roughly around $35 per unit. Um, in in UK it's about forty four. In Norway it's about thirty two dollars, and some other places even like Brazil is about over forty dollars. So that's exactly uh, the difference between the offshore operation and onshore operation. Let's see. I think Ricky actually pointed up a uh, bit of one on the uh, uh, upstream and downstream. So I have uh, this schematic diagram showing exactly what is it. So. Let's see what's on the upstream side. So it's the oil and gas. There, this is onshore uh, unit and this is offshore unit. So if I write a few lines for you, the upstream sector includes searching for subsurface uh, crude oil and gas. So drilling exploratory wells, it's all the exploration stage. I actually explain it a bit later. And subsequently drilling and operating the wells that contain crude oil, natural gas, it's the appraisal and development stage, finally producing oil and gas to the surface is a production stage. So those are the three main stages that I'm going to describe later on. Basically exploration, appraisal and development, and the, the production. What's downstream? Downstream um, the sector is actually the hydrocarbon extraction is completed from upstream, and then it's actually further the crude oil refinement and transport to the distribution or retail centers uh, also covered, uh, as you see it from the 
that's good to hear. Everything is sort of fine in storage and pipeline to the uh, to the uh, domestic usage outside for the industry or the public services. Uh, stage one of the ENP business. Uh, let's see what is it. So this uh, schematic diagram tells exactly what to do uh, or what oil industries uh, do for the uh, to understand where the oil is. So if discovery and evaluation is under exploration, that would take roughly around five to ten years. And then the development stage, once uh, uh, clarified or verified the, uh, the discovery, so you go to the next step, it's a development. And after the development, you actually do the production and mandal. That's actually for the, the last one. So before that, let me see exactly uh, what this uh, exploration is and appraisal is about. The hydrocarbons being at the surface using geophysical prospecting methods, reflecting seismology is one of the uh, key major um, um, investigation method we use on the, uh, the offshore uh, uh, countries. Uh, countries like, uh, of course, in Sri Lanka, we have, have also uh, gas reserves there as well in, in Norway, more than 50 years now doing the offshore exploration activities. You can see seismic boat actually travels above the sea uh, and on, on the water and then uh, running special air gun tools and then taking the reflection from each individual formation right beneath it. 2D seismic section is actually seen here, but a bit poor quality, but, uh, but there are plenty of good uh, quality 3D and 4D seismics available. In addition to seismic, we have a gravity and magnetic surveys for locating anomalies in the subsurface. So I see some kind of image down there. So the, uh, the gravity shows actually sedimentary formation right beneath the water and the formation containing the, uh, the gas or oil because the gas or oil is actually less dense. So you see that from a formation rocks to the, uh, the gas content or the oil content by taking into uh, gravity maps. And, uh, and the uh, magnetic maps also show the, the basement rocks and certain intrusions or a certain uh, density variations. Um, that's all kind of uh, geophysical prospecting methods we use for the uh, exploration. Exploration during will take place once the seismic target is identified with uh, using 2D and 3D. Um, if the well data shows a potential discovery, uh, further well tests are needed to verify and appraise the finding. So that's exactly now we are in this particular evaluation stage. Let's see exactly what the evaluation stage is uh, required for. You can see some of the uh, uh, schematic diagram on the uh, on the right, structural traps and stratigraphic traps. There are two kinds of uh, hydrocarbon traps underneath, like Sri Lanka is having stratigraphic traps, um, and in Norway, mostly about 90% of uh, stru uh, structural traps and uh, stratigraphic traps are very few. And those are the uh, the way that the hydrocarbons are trapped because the, uh, the gas and oil are pretty lower dense than the uh, surrounding formation, so they are actually migrated to a higher location and trapped beneath the shale formation, just like a permeable zone. On the stratigraphic case is different, that the geological formation is actually having different uh, porosities and different uh, spaces so that the hydrocarbon molecules can move out and then create uh, track there. So the, uh, the section down here says uh, exactly there are bits and pieces of hydrocarbon with gas and you need to have verification, you need to have a appraisal done to identify exactly where the hydrocarbon contains and what's the, exactly the volume. So the most importantly, evaluation is, uh, uh, is required before even development plans are being uh, carried further. The last one is when the oil rigs, uh, oil and gas in place uh, volume of the reservoir fluids is evaluated, the ENP company officials will decide whether or not to proceed in developing the field. So that's exactly the step here. It could take more than five years, or five to 10 years actually. Some of the Norwegian discoveries are verified uh, even 10 years after. So that's exactly the time spans needed for this kind of verification. Let's see further. Um, cycle two stage. Uh, this is a development stage. Um, if the discovery is profitable, the company needs to produce a PDO plan of development and operation to the authorities for their approval. ENP needs to develop a series of projections and plans covering the following. The operational procedures for the oil and gas production because the, uh, um, the authorities required exactly how the plans have been taken or actually taken into account of the cost-wise and then also the uh, taking the oil and gas in the high pressure 
um, devices I have used to, to extract the oil and gas. The reservoirs are usually about 2,500 psi in the reservoir, and then you have to take to the surface and so forth. So you need to have a design structure properly uh, sustainable to the uh, industrial requirement. Environmental protection uh, measures, uh, because it's an offshore uh, opportunity and offshore exploration, so you need to have a, a manipulate proper environmental protection measures, safety of the installation and staff, because uh, when it comes to a platform, so over 100 staff are, are active, and you need to have that kind of uh, installation safety of the staff as well. A benefit of the project communities, investors, and employees, well, that's one of the uh, particular case for the uh, for the government to take into account because the uh, communities uh, in that area and investors their money as well as the workers uh, are the uh, major assets. Requirements and guidelines with all stakeholders, as mentioned, so the uh, communities, investors, employees, and all the other suppliers, second secondary suppliers, uh, third party suppliers, and all are actually covered in this uh, stakeholder assessment. On the uh, regulator side, they would like to control ROI, return on investment. Uh, that's actually a kind of a thing with the, uh, even like, like Sri Lanka, if they actually allow the ENP company to work on, and they should know exactly uh, what they are uh, gain after the investment or, or the allowing them to uh, come and install on us, uh, they are workers. So it's the government and uh, actually a state and the communities should know exactly what the uh, return on investment are. Um, financial and technical capacity of the ENP company is also another thing that uh, should be uh, should be verified properly because the uh, basically well, the state companies, the state uh, authorities, regulators are very much keen on and kind of country like Norway keen on the uh, financial and technical capacity of the ENP company. Uh, impact of the project, if the desired outcome is not achievable. Uh, I know we have had this uh, oil price crisis in 2015 and even in uh, prior 2009 as well, 2015. Oil price uh, actually was about uh, over $100 and suddenly it gone down to about $30, $40. So uh, most of the uh, small scale ENP companies actually could not survive. So that kind of a thing, uh, the operation cannot be sustained uh, on that kind of situation. So I uh, need to have secondary plan B as well in the operation in that particular situation. Overall competency of the com operation is also one of the uh, key regulators control system to uh, see whether or not they are capable enough to uh, run through on the system for another 15, 20 years. I have some uh, schematic diagram down here from the uh, North Sea fields. Uh, I'll explain that on my later slides. Stage three uh, is actually production. The production phase covers lifting the hydrocarbons, oil and gas from the field to, and transporting them to a storage. So that's uh, that's the production side and the authorities require production for part approval process called PPAP. So PPAP defines everything on the standards uh, equipment and design structures and define, uh, designing all these pipeline systems and compliances and so forth. At uh, this stage, ENP decides how many production wells are needed to keep the reservoir pressure stable, because as you know, the reservoir pressure is over 1,500 to 2,500 PSI, so you actually get surface, uh, surface pressure, so that pressure drops make the heat production uh, and, and also quite a lot of uh, uh, has a hazardic situation when the uh, the pressure drop uh, to, the, uh, to the to the production terminal and the storage units and so forth. So, forth. so they need to have a proper design um, system to uh, sustain this uh, this kind of a, uh, methodology. So that's why uh, at this stage, uh, all the ENP companies run through optimize of fluid flow dynamic field model uh, uh, simulations to see exactly where the pressure run through the uh, like injection of uh, water, injection of gas uh, to keep the pressure, and then the production uh, is actually sustainable to a long distance with the uh, injection and production scenario. The last bit is, uh, is a crude oil natural gas is pumped out of the reservoir and passes through the gas well separator units before pumping this storage facility to SPA. FPSO. As you see, that's a floating production storage and offloading facility. 
this is one of the uh, the units that operate most of the uh, offshore uh, operating countries. And those two diagrams actually show exactly uh, what the subsea unit looks like and, and the FPSOs and all the uh, gas, refined gas are actually being stored in the FPSOs or, or maybe in the show base installations. The last one uh, is actually abandonment or decommissioning, we call it, uh, we, uh, wells and steel structures. Wells that are not actively involved in the field operation needed to fill or plug and abandon. So p &A is a process that all the ENP companies should take in care of. Regulators are often required ENP industries to follow their regulatory rules because most of the time, countries like in Norway, uh, last 50 years, if you look at the 30 to 40 wells uh, per, per year, or even further up to 100 wells, and think about 50 years, so they have to actually plug and abandon taking all the steel structures out of the uh, out of the uh, the environment due to environmental conditions. Now I put this, uh, this three slides on the left is from the Gulf of Mexico. Some of the platforms are still lying there for years and years. It's not that clean. So in the uh, sketch here is actually a budget for the decommissioning cost and in Norway, it's Norway in Corona, which is highest in 2015 to um, um, millions, I think it's a 10 billion Norwegian Corona is and divided by eight to get dollars. So it's roughly uh, pretty much money uh, for uh, for the amount of process, the commission process. So it's the same for global base as well. Well, let's see uh, technology related uh, to the oil and gas industry. Um, now I actually explain the uh, exploration part and in my previous slides. And here is actually summarize exactly what technology we use to, to for, for the discovery. So you see, some description is required. That's the uh, basically a verification or evaluation or appraising stage. You need to have a lot of uh, uh, well data samples, either geological, geophysical, um, testing of uh, liquid coming from uh, from uh, discovery wells. All these are analyzed uh, on, on in the laboratories or in the computing centers and get all the description. That's why description. See whether it's a um, the pressure information, temperature information, saturation, uh, and, and all this kind of information is being gathered and then used for the uh, modeling, for the 3D model development. Your physical data analysis, like acoustic information, uh, density, and acoustic parameters. Geomechanical me studies have been used to find out whether or not the overburden pressure stabilizes when the, uh, when the hydrocarbon is, uh, is planned to uh, produce. Well placement is required as well because if some of the structurally um, uh, entrapped the reservoirs are in bits and pieces, so they have to have a proper uh, side tracking or proper offshore drilling uh, technology to capture maximum reservoir blocks. So, so the well placement is a kind of a, a computer simulation procedure to find out whether all the capturing uh, blocks are, are nicely done. You go to the next step. When the discovery is approved and validated and appraised, so you go to the next level to, to go for development. For the, when it comes to development, well, design optimization is required because, uh, as I said earlier, so it's very much the design optimization that makes the production, uh, production scenario function very well. Secondary recovery is as well because some of the uh, matured reservoirs are, are actually uh, collapsing due to the pressure drops and maybe injection, water injection or gas injection not uh, stabilized properly to the model. Completion optimization is one of the, uh, the must process to, uh, to be able to see exactly to um, authorize uh, to, uh, the government authority actually control them for the acidic situation. Uh, step three is the field under production, uh, integrated reservoir studies, uh, because some of the uh, oil fields, when it comes to mature stage, they need to have more and more production wells. So one of the production wells added to the existing well system. So you need to have actually integrated studies to see exactly how the uh, saturation uh, and the water saturation, gas saturation, oil saturation are uh, balanced very well. Because as you know, the, uh, the, the density is low density gas on the top the oil in the middle and the water in the bottom, 
once the, the top layers are produced, they automatically vote injection uh, to the, the reservoir zone. So we have to have a water flooding optimization methodology to computer simulation to find out exactly the flooding mechanism for, let's say, it's a monthly basis, uh, uh, annual basis, see exactly how the water front moves to the reservoir. And the sand water management is another technology because, uh, as you know, the reservoir contains the uh, sandstone. Uh, uh, fine sand particles moving into the uh, to the oil well, and then the uh, it's actually blocking the uh, the perforation zone. So in order to release that, we need to have a study on sand management technique. So only all the steps that I discuss here for the discovery, development, and the production, you need to have a proper technology. I'm actually showing this uh, slide section on the bottom what sort of uh, uh, technical disciplines that actually integrated in the system. Further in that, you have the reservoir evaluation technology, uh, petrophysics, exostics, uh, borehole geology and geophysics, well placement, and so forth. There are uh, quite a lot of uh, subunits in, in the exploratory uh, system that works into. So I will go for the next step, uh, the technical domain. Um, I use the geophysics. Um, for the uh, investigations and the borehole geology for the uh, scanning the uh, well section and see exactly dips and formations. Uh, the well placement is actually for use for the uh, for the analysis exactly see whether or not all the soil sections are captured properly. And the well integrity engineering is also to stabilize the soil sections. And the soil production engineering is to simulate the uh, soil zones to see whether the production is uh, properly petrophysics for all the potential analysis to study. So just to have to pass through quickly as uh, the time coming closer. So I think I will uh, go through quickly to see exactly complex geo-environment in advanced 3D technology. This is the uh, uh, section uh, where the marine acquisition system for the 3D seismic um, has been taken. Uh, and once the seismic volume is acquired, so you see that uh, uh, is it like a cube, a cube of seismic uh, acoustic information, and you can run through any uh, well track you need it. This is the well track placement seismic volume acquired from a 3D technology. So once it is done, you do actually 3D modeling. 3D modeling is actually this is the one one line is actually horizon. The horizon is put onto the uh, section to create a three dimensional model, and you actually do the well properties and then propagate the well properties through uh, different algorithms to, to run through. And once it's all done, so we actually our drillers are able to manipulate the drilling path before you even start drilling through computer modeling techniques to get the maximum part. Synergy between universities and research and industry. So I just try to capture exactly what we have to do in the drilling. So before that, I would like to actually show actually a couple of things for how the Norway actually manage their resources. Uh, this, state, uh, this slide is actually taken from Minister of Energy. Uh, predictability, transparency, and stability is one of their target points. Uh, clarity of the clarity of the state different roles because uh, cannot be cross uh, uh, sort of like you know uh, manage cross management issues. Uh, they are states pretty pretty much in uh, in observing that their individual states clarities are properly defined, striking the right balance between attracting internationally entry companies and building domestic industry. That's exactly I have seen the last thirty years in Norway. At the very beginning, it's so pretty much a developing industry now is more saturated. Norwegian companies are established. International participators pretty much appreciated here. More than thirty international companies uh, actually are. Uh, are uh, stationed here and the national control. This is very important point that uh, Sri Lanka in context as well if we try to we do the uh, gas business uh, for ourselves. Look at these uh, figures here. So 1970 uh, per capita income in Norway, $3,306. The same as Sri Lanka now. So now 2019, more or less about the uh, 50 years after, $72,850. So see the improvement for 50 years of oil production, oil and gas. So why can't we do the same? So now is it 2021, if Sri Lanka starts next year, let's say it's another 10 years to, to develop properly, so per capita will rise up to the sky. So, so we have to make sure that what Norway did, so we should do in Sri Lanka as well. Population at that time in Norway was about 3.8 million. 
growth of population, not that much, but the per capita grown up by 22 times because of the, uh, the correct uh, resource management process that they employ here. Let's see what the uh, uh, what we can do with the industry and the uh, the R and D and the universities. For over fifty years, NCS Norwegian Continental Shelf had been the breeding ground for developing solutions and technologies. The benefits of R and D investments are cost reduction in operation, increase in recovery, secure environment. So those are the three key pillars that we have in, in these two uh, segments. Let's see what's actually say about the uh, or statistics that is actually show what are the uh, education background from the industry. Uh, this is only 1% PhD holders and majority, more than half of that act high school leavers and so forth. Let's see a uh, university and industry case here. What the universities and industry collaborate that they should do. The industry needs to provide a suitable base for training and skill development. And the industry should bring additional funds for new inventions. Universities should be able to provide competent graduates to match industry requirements. That's a collaboration. That's how our industry should understand. And they have to provide the additional finance to the universities because universities are running on government state funds. So they need to have funds. They need to have to uh, um, um, sort of like, you know, Encouraging uh, system that the open hands by the industry. Universities should allow direct access to their research community for laboratories and training centers. Two way communication required at the uh, learning, teaching, and testing are the three main steps in the new invention cycle. So that's the universities and R&D side. What about the industry and R&D side? What they should think about? R&D should be well aligned with industry's requirements. The industry should be able to finance needed funds and R&D institutions. The industry should also need a training and factory facilities if R&D scientists are engaged in dynamic, uh, innovative research. I didn't mean that dynamic means industrial requirements only, but uh, it's a kind of a right balance you need to, uh, by, the, uh, by the industry to support the financing for the R&D R &D, uh, people. This is kind of a, a summary for capturing what we have to do with the power bank. Um, Sri Lankan universities involvement in the upstream and downstream sectors. Let's see exactly currently for available courses in two universities, the University of Moratu and Earth Science Resource Engineering. This is, these are things that I captured from internet. It's uh, uh, nothing I communicated with any of the individual professors or the uh, head of the department, please forgive me if something is wrong. Definitely we have to communicate in the future to be able to, uh, to cooperate what we can do from this end to your side. There are two universities offering uh, uh, like uh, upstream kind of a study programs like uh, Earth Science Engineering from Moratua and the Department of Geology providing the BSc special honor degrees and their coverage of subjects. And I actually kept some of the things that I don't want to go in detail, but it's uh, earth science coverage. Let's see what else are there technical disciplines for up and downstream operations are carried on by the university. I see that the mechanical engineering, material sciences and engineering, chemical and process engineering, those are the three major uh, engineering disciplines that required for the uh, down, uh, downstream uh, sectors, uh, mechanical engineers for the uh, piping and all the uh, industrial requirement designing, materials and sciences, they have been cooperating with the uh, most of the downstream uh, uh, stuff and the chemical and process engineers of course for the uh, piping issues, flow issues, uh, flow science and, and, and practical issues. Like that. And I segregated other three disciplines like electrical and electronic, telecom engineering, transport and logistics and computer science are required basically for both downstreams and upstream. So we have the caliber, we have the university uh, community and universities program, but exactly whether or not our industries up to that level, whether to capture their background or their staff. So um, this is actually a, a, some kind of a uh, right way we have to think about getting the university uh, staff and teachers and R&D staff to work. That's it. That's my last presentation. This is the Midnight Sun uh, from Norway and Aurora, one of them likes it. Thank you very much for listening. Hello. 
Thank you, Dr. Ratnavir. Dr. Indrajit. Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kapil Edirivir and uh, Kriki Barnett uh, for that very informative session uh, about the uh, Sri Lankan journey on the uh, on oil and gas industry as well as uh, the global perspectives and what uh, things that we need to improve in our educational sector. And our next presenter, Dr. Kapil, uh, can I share the screen, please? Dr. Prini. Okay, our next uh, speaker is the uh, Director of Benefits of Petroleum Resource Development Secretariat. She is a chartered mechanical engineer holding over 27 years of experience in engineering and management functioning, including uh, 12 years in administrating upstream petroleum operations. She is also a corporate member of the Institute of Engineers Sri Lanka and a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. Today, she will be talking about the recent initiatives taken to develop offshore oil and gas exploration and key human resource challenges. So please join me in welcoming Engineer Prini Vitanage. Over to you, Engineer Vitanage. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all see my presentation? Can one of you all uh, confirm? Yeah, we can see your presentation. Yes. Thank you, EDB, for giving me this opportunity, but I am left, at, left with very limited time, so I'll try to rush through. I'm very thankful to Ricky and Dr. Kabila. You have covered most of what I really wanted to tell you tell in detail so I can rush through. Uh, well, what you see here is our previous block map uh, with the 20 exploration, large exploration blocks. Uh, located in Kaveri, Mena, and Lanka basins. And actually, I will start, I will uh, try, uh, briefly explain you our oil and gas exploration efforts thus far and the uh, success we have achieved to date. Um, as you all know now, uh, as you all know, we have drilled seven wells uh, uh, during 1974 uh, to 1984, but uh, there was not much success. Uh, but uh, those data was very valid for us to continue with exploration. And in 2013, Vicky has almost explained very well, uh, Kian drilled the four wells and uh, we have found, made two gas discoveries and uh, Dorado uh, and Barracuda. Then Valago well, the drilled in 2019 was uh, actually abandoned prematurely. So there was a fault uh, in the drill ship. So they'll have to, you know, abandon it prematurely and Dorado you know, was, was, you know, abandoned as a dry hole. Uh, well, then in 2000, um, uh, then in 2016, from 2016 to 2020, uh, uh, there was a small uh, short uh, exploration study conducted by uh, <coughs> Total of France and Equino of Norway together, joint study. Actually, they also have found, uh, identified some oil and gas potential but in ultra, ultra deep water block, these two blocks, but uh, unfortunately that was not that commercially viable for them to proceed with further exploration. So they concluded the survey uh, study in uh, 2020, September, 2020 last year, but this data is very valid for us. Then in 2019, we uh, had a mini bit round uh, uh, and now actually these days, uh, currently we are, uh, negotiating a petroleum resource agreement with the, with the successful bidder. So these are basically uh, some success that far that we have achieved. In addition to that, uh, we have initiated uh, very many uh, multi-client data acquisition, processing, reprocessing, marketing and licensing project at no cost to the government. So this is the uh, acquisition, uh, acquisition processing and a reprocessing uh, multi-client project with Schlumberger. Uh, uh, from 2016 to date, and actually they have uh, done, they have 
at five to the seismic data at the east uh, northeast, as well as uh, one few lines around uh, towards southern area and uh, West Mena. And in fact, they have uh, reprocessed some uh, legacy data that we have acquired in 2001 and 2005, as well as 2009. So the, all this data is available for uh, operators uh, on multi-client basis. And uh, in fact, these are our future developments in, the, in, the, in terms of MC program with Schramberger. They have planned few acquisition, uh, data acquisition surveys in 2022. So we are going to have few more activities in our waters uh, with these uh, acquisition programs. And uh, <clears throat> currently we are actually conducting gravity magnetic, airborne gravity magnetic survey over the survey area. Uh, we commenced the survey in August uh, 20, uh, or August this year, and we had our press, brief, uh, press briefing very recently. And uh, after this, after completing this survey area, uh, Bel Belgium, they will pro probably extend uh, uh, their surveys in future for the demarcated uh, area that we have already signed with them. Yeah, up until now, actually, we have uh, done our best PRDS with our minimum resources uh, to attract investors. But uh, we being a uh, um, frontier basin, deep water frontier basin, we had very many challenges. Uh, there's a lot I could talk about, but unfortunately, I'm, I have very limited time within 10 minutes, it's difficult. But these are key, basically key challenges what I have highlighted policy, investment, and human resources. When it comes to certain policy challenges, we have actually, we could manage to somewhat overcome uh, with, uh, with recent initiatives. We gazetted national policy on natural gas in October, 2020. This is uh, available in our website and uh, it's already published and available in our website. Actually, this gives a very good, uh, this is a very, very handy document for investors who are, you know, coming to our waters uh, in future for uh, gas developments. And uh, <clears throat> we had uh, actually a <clears throat> very long-standing issue with our uh, act, previous Petroleum Resources Act, current act, then well, we have come up with a new Petroleum Resources Act of 2021. We have already gazetted and it is to be tabled at the parliament very soon. Actually, this, will, this, uh, this act will clearly give very independent and efficient policy framework, regulatory framework, and an operational framework. Uh, I would say that would basically eliminate all most of the you know, investment barriers we have had with the previous act. Then when it comes to investment challenges, actually <coughs> we have, we had our, <coughs> our old, our previous exploration block map, we had predefined large exploration blocks, which was not that attractive under current uh, market, uh, trends. So we have come up with a new exploration block map, what you can see here. And these are quite small blocks. We have demarcated this into 873 uh, blocks, small blocks, 15 by 15 kilometer, uh, flexible uh, with flexible acreage choice and investment models for investors. And we'll be launching this strategy very soon. Then policy decision to offer blocks on joint study options extended across, across all three bases. In, initially, we had this joint study option, short exploration uh, programs only for the ultra deep water basin. But recently, we, our Petroleum Resources Development Committee took a policy decision to extend that uh, option as well for the other areas. So, <clears throat> so we have more flexibility in attracting uh, investors for this uh, <clears throat> either for the small box or combined set of box. Then increase, we have already, I have already discussed increased multiple and data acquisitions. Then we have, we are planning to commence another study to find accelerated development options for Dorado uh, discovery of block M2. We'll be commencing that study very soon. And uh, mind you, we have now commenced our marketing campaign. Uh, Please visit this uh, link that I have given. You can get a lot of information over there. So we could manage to basically, you know, overcome few challenges we have had thus far, but unfortunately we are left with the most important, that is the human resources challenge. 
actually PRDS. Uh, we have done fair amount of work. Uh, I know this Vicky and uh, those those were service subcontractors uh, would witness. Actually, we have uh, done a lot of educational development programs, developed curriculum development programs for the for five universities, and we have provided internships close to 70 uh, undergraduates from all these five universities. And uh, we have, uh, in fact, our operators and our service subcontractors have uh, give, uh, provided them uh, hardware, software facilities and uh, to upgrade their laboratories. And uh, we have actually 30 odd uh, R&D, collaborative R&D thus far conducted with this university. So all, of, all this information in, is there in our website. Please visit uh, benefits page, PRDS website uh, for more details. So human resources is one of the biggest challenges we do face at the moment. So let me further elaborate on that. So even now, even at the moment, we have very limited activities when it comes to upstream. So therefore, we have very limited employment and industrial training opportunities in Sri Lanka. This is one of the major challenges we face. And lack of experience and competent professionals in Sri Lanka. Uh, we have very limited actually uh, trained staff, even at PRDS, but as you all know that oil and gas is a high paid industry. And some, most, some of them have already left PRDS and gone for you know, seeking foreign avenues. So this is, this is one of the biggest challenge actually. Now, even if you train them locally, how to retain them? So whether, whether our country would be in a position to afford to retain them. So these are things that we may need to face in, uh, when we are developing human resources. It has to you know, go along with other mechanisms. Then high cost of imported knowledge skills. Now, suppose if you are at this point, if you are going to import knowledge and skills, it costs a lot to the government. And even the consultants, they are even short term assignments are very costly for us when it comes to uh, even a 10, five, five days program, five to 10, five days, five days, uh, normal economics or some uh, sector specific training costs about uh, 15 to 20 million for 20 participants. So, I mean, how far we are going to go ahead uh, with this uh, imported knowledge and skills. So there's no chance. So we'll have to somehow build this knowledge and skills uh, uh, within our country. So, and we have no oil and gas learning and development opportunities in Sri Lanka. This is one of the other, uh, I think, uh, drawback. In, unlike other producing countries, they all these uh, graduates they have these, uh, you know, opportunities. And we have actually less focus on integrated solutions. And in Sri Lanka, this is the biggest problem I see in Sri Lanka. We all work in isolation. Now we are confined to upstream, mid and downstream. We, we, we hardly have a midstream, but I would say the downstream. CPC, Ceylon Petrol Company, they, they we all work in isolation at the moment. And other integrated energy solutions, renewable energy. So I think if we are going to, you know, target on a certain focus on a certain uh, skill set, we may have to think of some integrated solution in future. Then when it comes to education, I think Dr. Kapil has fairly, I mean, he has covered a lot, so I don't want to reiterate. it. Basically, what I see, we have very good opportunities when it comes to vocational, undergraduate, postgraduate, and CPD courses. Actually, we have our, our skill set when it comes to our university graduates, especially engineering and other fields. They, they have very good theoretical knowledge. It's a matter of the opportunity and some form of uh, training that we need, post, either postgraduate or CPD in certain areas. But there are certain other areas that we really, specialized areas that we really need to, you know, set up certain uh, <coughs> skills and programs. So that I will explain in my <coughs> other slides. And of course, this R&D research and development, this should be a must uh, for this sector to grow. Like we don't have no funds, no opportunities, no collaborative research with foreign other universities. So this is a sector I think that we have marvelous opportunities we are not uh, making use of like. Then the industry-sponsored educational opportunities. Uh, this is, I think, Dr. Kapila simply, uh, I know that he covered it basically now, like there are many oil and gas companies and service companies. You know, they, they, uh, they could manage to fulfill their requirements through this industry-sponsored educational programs, you know, uh, getting into this university cells. 
So do we have this mechanism in our universities? So this is something that we need to think of. Then mandatory HS certificates. Now, suppose even if you, uh, <clears throat> even if you mold a good graduate who could you know, be able to uh, take up any opportunity job uh, in the oil and gas sector, then what if he has to get a few more certifications for like you know, safety certifications for firefighting, et cetera. So these, even these programs are very costly. I mean, our poor students were, I don't think that they, I mean, after spending so much for their education, how well they are going to, you know, <clears throat> go ahead acquiring this uh, <clears throat> certification. So, so these are all challenges that we may need to, you know, face, but why not we think, I mean, these are all challenges before us, why not we think some exto exportable skill set? because this is export development board, because we can be a very good knowledge hub, you know, Singapore, they don't have any oil and gas resources, but that's a world-class knowledge hub for all oil and gas uh, expert personnel. So why not we also think of uh, exportable skill set? Actually, I'm very happy that EDB has, you know, come up with this kind of a committee and trying to, you know, uh, introduce something uh, and uh, some workable mechanism. And uh, why not think, I mean, whatever it is, rather than working in iso isolation, what we need is a focal point for HR development in Sri Lanka. This is one of my suggestions. How will we could have focal point that could address all these challenges as then we can have few more foreign affiliations. We could, you know, uh, drag the <coughs> work out for funds. There can be private public partnerships. Actually private sector should also take the lead when it comes to HR. So this is something that I would like to, you know, uh, discuss more with EDB in time to come. And this is an interesting side slide, in fact, what I, you know, browsed for this presentation. Actually, I wanted to find out the demand for jobs uh, by category, globally for oil and gas, and see the number for engineering jobs. So this is a very good, uh, and oil and gas support jobs. These are the two uh, highest demand jobs I found in this particular site. So these are areas, these are very good research that our undergraduates could do. What are the areas that we could, you know, strengthen our <clears throat> curriculum in order to uh, prepare a skill set as exportable graduates. Then these are some, I'll come back to the skills requirement to sustain the industry. Actually, I have identified few areas, specialized technical skills, some like geology, geophysics, drilling, reservoir engineering, subsea development, well testing, these are very specialized. Now, our, our, our general, Geology, uh, ge ge geology graduate, it is impossible, I mean, without giving specific training or another postgraduate to you know, come up to certain standards. So these are very specialized skill set that we need to introduce to the universities. Uh, and there are many, you know, when we are going to introduce these skill sets, we need uh, certain, you know, software that, uh, that uh, and laboratory facilities for them to conduct all this, uh, to gain this uh, standard, uh, skill levels. So we may need to think in future if we are going to go ahead, uh, how well we are going to go ahead with HR development. Then supporting technical skills, actually uh, something like, you know, petroleum law, economics, QHG, logistics, uh, production, metering, monitoring. These, of course, I mean, we have very good graduates uh, passing out from our universities. I mean, it's a matter of giving them a light push, I mean, some assistance some training and CPD and postgraduate or whatever, where we could, you know, mold them for these supporting technicals, unlike the specialized technicals, because when it comes to specialized technicals, we need actually a very small number for, the, for our country. And, uh, but uh, this has a very good market globally. Then data related skills, like, I mean, this is actually, we, there's a lot of, you know, able to handle endless supply of information when it comes to data related skills in the oil and gas sector. So we need data analysis, data management, storage, copying, and transfer. This is another very specialized skill set. So what uh, our universities can think of if, when they are preparing curriculum. Then mathematical and IT skills. Of course, we do. We have plenty of uh, good uh, skilled, uh, well, good graduates, but not focused to this particular area. So this is something that we need to think of, how to integrate, our, how, to, how to fill that gap. Then management skills, actually administration, regulation operations, stakeholder management, supply chain management, EPC, HR, financial. 
Actually, this is yet again something that we can manage with our graduates with some form of backing. Then other vocational skills like welding, communication, the corporations. Of course, now when it comes to vocational, I know that uh, uh, Colombo Dockyard, they have a separate training center. And likewise, there are some private campuses like Scenic, few other campuses, they technical colleges, they work you know, in isolation with their specific skills. And why not? That is what I said. There should be a focal point who could communicate, who could coordinate with all these uh, work, you know, all these training centers. And also, you know, to see how well we could introduce the specialized oil and gas training modules and uh, some field training for these vocational students and export them. Now, recently we had a very good dialogue with the uh, UAE, uh, Sri Lankan ambassador, and actually he, then we are working on some mechanism, how well we could introduce uh, uh, interns, graduate industrial training or internships for these vocational students as well as for our graduates. Uh, so these are things that we need to, you know, work out when we are going to develop our future HR development plan. And actually this, uh, uh, I want to actually show you the re uh, <coughs> skills requirement gap. Now, when it comes to oil and gas, I know that engineering, I saw that one of the highest demanding area in the, when it comes to oil and gas. And uh, you can see in red, these are basically this production engineer, mechanical design engineer, process engineer. I mean, these things, what, what I have, you know, uh, uh, stated in black color, I mean, this can be as you said, I mean, we can, uh, somewhat, uh, you know, give some form of a backing to our existing uh, uh, graduates uh, and, uh, you know, bring them to a um, particular level. But these are very specific skills, right? These are wire of shows up, C field engineers, ROV engineers. So, uh, so when we are developing curriculum, we'll have to identify if we are, we are, you know, planning our curriculum development, you know, we have to think of two sectors, whether that is one for in-house, requirements and thinking exportable requirements. So I think uh, we would, if we could, uh, you know, <clears throat> come up with the proper strategy, how well we could address uh, uh, this uh, requirement gaps uh, that will be very beneficial for the country in future. Then geosciences, you can see now, these are geologists, we have geologists, we have geophysicists. But you see the amount of demand you have in the oil and gas in the it's red color. So we have not, you know, fulfilled this requirement uh, within our academic background. And when it comes to health and safety, it's the same story. I will, I will don't have to, you know, uh, explain in detail. I'll share these slides with all of y'all. And uh, all this, all this, even marine sector. Marine sector, of course, actually, I think we have fairly, we are, fairly, we are doing fairly well. But still, for all, when it comes to oil and gas, there are a few things that we need to, you know, uh, focus into like dynamic position, ROV operators and divers, things like that. Uh, then commercial and financial and legal, of course, we have. I know that uh, we have very good graduates. But still for all, we have, we need some sector specific economics, cost benefit analysis and planning and economic analysis and performance driven analysis. So this kind of, you know, sector specific skills that we can develop in these areas as well. And this is basically the vocational uh, trades operations and skilled and semi-skilled areas. You can see these crane operators, of course, you know, it's a matter of uh, once you give them a training, they'll, you know, adjust uh, with uh, the environment but you need to give them a proper exposure with uh, uh, our rigs or whatever, the future development facilities. But still for all, there are, there are many number of, you know, demands, many, you know, number of uh, opportunities globally for these positions. Uh, so this is something what we can, you know, look at. And IT and communication, of course, uh, we are doing fairly well. So if you are planning for our actually uh, skill set, I do suggest that we need to think of uh, integrated energy solutions. I don't think we can survive upstream alone, doing upstream uh, projects alone. We need to, you know, uh, oil and gas. 
uh, it is expected that this uh, oil and gas, this petroleum industry is sort of like, you know, finishing in another few years time, sorry, so another 50 to uh, 40 to 60 years time. Uh, so we, sh and you know, there are a lot of other emerging energy sources uh, like, you know, solar, wind, waste energy, hydrogen, uh, wave energy, all that. So I don't think that we can, you know, our skill set should be, you know, prepared uh, sort of like for an integrated uh, kind of an environment. Now you can see upstream. Now upstream, now there are very many opportunities for small scale FLNG. Now if you have marginal discoveries, these are actually, this is an emerging trend for small scale uh, FLNG. And you know, yeah, then you can have, you can use our gas, you can use this gas discoveries for compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas. So this for certain transportation requirements, not only power, there are many other applications that we can think of. Uh, then in time to come, this is basically the future. How well you can go for uh, blue hydrogen with our gas. Then <clears throat> gas to power substation. We can have gas to power substation combined with solar, wind, wave energy. We see some form of integrated, integra integrated options that we may need to think in time to come, not alone upstream, when we are going to prepare our skill set. And oil refineries. Now, what when it comes to Sri Lanka, actually oil refineries, it's purely, you know, managed by the government sector. But why not like in other countries, land-based small scale uh, refineries, then mobile offshore refineries, things like that, that may come up in time to come. So I think, I, never mind, we may not be having these opportunities, but I think we should be in a position to expose our uh give the give, give the exposure to our students so what are these uh, coming up options and what are the other opportunities uh, available globally and value added and uh, value sorry and uh, value added uh, products uh, for export market like fertilizer petrochemical products this is this is basically export market so why not i think uh, if we can, if we can, you know, uh, come up with a good uh, set of uh, training curriculum for our vocational university and also well as postgraduate students, how well they can do kind, some kind of research into these areas and see uh, well uh, whether they could, you know, uh, you know, mold themselves or, you know, <clears throat> uh, think of. Uh, uh, diversifying their knowledge for these areas where they could set up export-oriented uh, business. Uh, so with that, I will wind my presentation and thank you very much, uh, this committee, for giving me this opportunity. Dr. Indrajit, you're on mute. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ms. Freenitanagay, for discussing about oil and gas exploration developments in Sri Lanka and uh, required skills and capacity developments in all levels of education, and also highlighting the job market and potential for oil and gas sector. So thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. With us and, uh, uh, with that, I think uh, we can move on to a short question and answer session. Um, so we, for the q and session actually, uh, uh, Dr. Saratobe Sekara, you have any comments? I mean, can you hear me? Yes. Right. Uh, shall I start or are we having the question and answer session? I think uh, we can move on the question and answer sessions to the at the end because we are running out of time. So I think I'll limit my presentation for a very quick one and hand over to uh, Dr. Um, Ravin Vijayaratna from Singapore because he needs to do a presentation. Then I'll do a brief presentation. Ravin, can you start, please?
Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can see my screen. Um, yeah, my name is Ravin Vijayaratna. I'm welding engineer, project quarter lead at Semcorp Marine. So I'm presenting from Singapore, actually. So my topic today is on the design and construction of the FPSO. Um, so when we talk about um, the upstream fixed floating production facilities uh, for oil and gas exploration, we have a variety of uh, production facilities available uh, for usage. So this, each facility depends on the, the, the depth of the water and the exploration area. So we can start with jackup rigs where the depth is quite low towards um, fixed platforms, compliant tower, TLP, which is, which is uh, tension lake platforms, semi-submersible, sparse, and FPSO. So the FPSO is mostly for deep water depths for the highest depth up to 7,000 meters. So an FPSO is more suited for marginally economical fields located in remote deep water areas where pipeline infrastructure does not exist. So an FPSO stands for floating production, storage, and offloading system. Um, so basically an FPSO is uh, divided into four categories, four parts. First is for the hull, the living quarter, then on top of it is the top side modules, followed with the mooring system. Uh, so basically the hull of an FPSO weighs around 60,000 to 80,000 tons. Uh, the top side modules, 20,000 to 50,000 tons, mooring system, 10,000 tons. So these are massive production units, which are fixed in the ocean. They don't move, they are stationary, floating in the oil production field. So the total engineering production uh, engineering procurement, construction, and commissioning costs is between USD 1 billion to 2.5 billion for the construction and the whole process of a single FPSO. So of course, only a very few selected EPC contractors and shipyards in the world are capable of constructing um, FPSOs. So basically, FPSOs are categorized into two main categories. They are ship-shaped FPSOs and cylindrical or circular hull FPSOs. So the cylindrical circular hull FPSOs are new build. Then you come to the ship shape FPSO. These are, you get the new build hull followed by modules and mooring as well as FPSO conversion. Conversion means conversion of an existing VLCC. VLCC is very large container carrier to an FPSO. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. A uh, new build FPSO, of course, it's the cost, it's the construction cost is high, but it has a higher life extension, more than 30 years. On the other hand, a uh, conversion FPSO construction cost is less with slightly lesser extension life, maybe 25 years in the oil field. So what is an FPSO? Um, an FPSO is a floating production system that receives fluids uh, crude oil, water, and a host of other minerals from a subsea reservoir through risers, all right, which then separate fluids into crude oil, natural gas, water, and impurities within the top side modules over here on the vessel. And then the crude oil, uh, uh, top side production facilities on board, and the crude oil stored in the storage tanks of the FPS is offloaded onto shuttle tankers to go to the market for further refining. So basically, you see the subsea systems down here on the seabed. So basically, the fluids rise from the subsea reservoirs, including crude oil, natural gas, water, and impurities. Uh, fluids flow up through flexible or rigid pipes known as risers onto the FPSO through the mooring system. So ship-shaped FPSOs, um, here are a few of the ship-shaped FPSOs. Um, uh, BW offshore, uh, BW Catcher is a new build FPSO, then Karish FPSO on the right hand side, one of the new build FPSOs I'm doing currently. Uh, bottom, uh, uh, bottom left is um, the Glen Leon, new build FPSO constructed in South Korea. And the bottom right hand side is a Petrobras FPSO conversion project. So features of an FPSO hull, um, 
So coming to the hull of an FPS, so I'm taking, so different EPC contractors have different hull designs. So I'm for, focusing on the Modic M350i design. Uh, usually on average, this uh, FPS, so the length of an FPSO is between uh, 350 to 450 meters in length. So this is 350 meters in length, 64 meters wide, uh, 33 meters in depth. Uh, so the main features of an M350 hull include a full double hull, you can see on the top right hand corner. A double hull means a double side and double bottom, thereby this uh, alleviating industry concerns about single bottom and late life corrosion. So the storage capacity of an FPSO is up to 350 meter cubes of oil, uh, design life 25 years or more. It also has an helideck, uh, bottom right-hand corner you can see, a large stand-based living quarters or accommodation up to 200 to 300 people. And also it has an overall storage capacity of 2.2 million barrels. Uh, the, the deck area on the main deck of an FPSO is 18,000 meters squares, uh, which is the size of three and a half uh, football fields. So these are massive hulls, uh, which we need for oil production uh, in uh, the respective oil field. So again, for the hull, when we construct the hull of an FPS, so we basically divide it into five, comp uh, five main blocks, all right? They are known as mega blocks. Uh, these mega blocks may be fabricated in different yards, and then they are brought into a single yard for hull integration in a dry dock. You can see bottom right hand corner. So the main blocks, you can see uh, the aft block, the mid hull block, forward mega block. Uh, then on top is, is the LQ living quarters and the heli deck. So next is about the top side modules of an FPS saw. Um, so basically the top side modules, they are process modules are designed to separate the produced water and gas from crude oil and to reduce the content of salt and H2S in crude oil. Um, all process equipments on top side process modules is interconnected with piping, electrical and instrumentation. So top side modules are uh, mostly constructed in uh, very limited yards uh, in China, Thailand, Airbel Yard, Singapore Dynamac, Keppel, Semcorp Marine, Indonesia, uh, also Semcorp Marine, Malaysia, and MMHC. Uh, the hull of an FPSO is also pretty limited because of the size of an FPSO. So uh, China, South Korea, and Singapore are the leading countries in the world that construct these FPSOs for different clients around the whole world. So these are some photos of top set modules I have taken in my time in Singapore. Uh, different process modules you can see um, various during construction stage on the bottom right hand corner is an e-house uh, various mod modules these are very challenging modules to construct with a lot of stringent requirements and 100 percent ndt basically so once the, the top side modules are constructed they have to be integrated onto the fpso hull so the fpso hull is uh, undocked and berth beside the quayside and then like floating cranes like this are used for floating cranes with a capacity of up to 5,000 tons are used to load all the modules one by one with uh, very limited uh, diamond, uh, dimension control is up to the millimeters, very strict dimensional control uh, with higher stringent quality. Uh, again, limited shipyards due to crane uh, capability and yard track record are capable of uh, topside integration. Korea, Hyundai, Samsung, GSME, Singapore, Kepa Shipyard, number one, I think 120 FPSO integrations, number one in the world, also Semcorp Marine. So we come to the pass of a top side module. These are, so the top side modules is where, like I said earlier, where all the oil and gas is processed. The minerals which come from the subsea system are processed here. It's like the production facility. So basically, uh, top side modules of an average FPSO, you get 12 to 18 different modules stacked up on the deck area of the hull. So you get the cooling water exchangers, seawater treatment, uh, injection, power generator, production and test manifold uh, station, uh, gas injection and oil metering uh, modules, crude oil offloading modules, um, electro dehydration modules, utilities, e-house. So these are the modules, various modules you get. Uh, in an FPSO. 
Uh, this is one of the FPSOs. So basically, large FPSOs uh, based on VLCC conversions can have top size weighing exceeding over 35,000 tons, with production rates exceeding over 180,000 barrels per day. So massive, massive production facilities uh, we have uh, for the oil and gas exploration. We need this to produce the oil uh, for offloading to the shuttle tankers or refining. So here I've shown basically the crude oil is separated in the topside modules uh, for facilities on both the FPSO. Uh, they are stored in internal tanks of the FPSO and it's then offloaded. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side to uh, shuttle tankers to go to the market for further refining on shore. Next are mooring systems of an FPSO. Uh, basically the mooring system, you can see there are two types of main mooring systems. Uh, the turret mooring system and the spread mooring system. So the main function of the mooring system is to anchor the FPSO. The FPSO is stationary. It's floating in the same location for 30 years in the uh, oil and in the oil field in the middle of the ocean. Uh, so they have they are fixed and they rotate around this mooring system. All right. Uh, so basically, the different types of mooring system based are based on the location of an FPSO. So there are the, you get four types of mooring uh, systems, the spread mooring system, external turret, internal turret, and tower yolk. Uh, so the main designers for these mooring systems are SBM Offshore, Sofec, APL, and Novi. Uh, main fabricators are Kepper Shipyard, uh, Dubai Dry Docks, and in Batam, also uh, NOV in Batam, they fabricate uh, these turrets. So in this slide, I've shown the different mooring systems. The spread mooring system, you can see uh, on the top left-hand corner, basically the moorings are on the hull, on the port and starboard of the hull, side hull, uh, which anchors onto the seabed. So, and then you get the external turret on the right-hand corner, a right-hand top side, then the tower yoke and the internal turret. So the turret mooring system is critical for harsh weather conditions. In this sense, the turret enables the FPSO to, free, free, uh, to freely rotate while moved to various locations on the sea floor. So these are some examples. So turret integration, we integrate with a floating, uh, floating crane. We are here, we are integrating the submerged turret production module by part of an internal turret mooring system uh, for API, uh, APL NOV design. So once again, these are the four types of uh, turret mooring systems. You can see internal turret, spread mooring, external turret, and tower yoke. Uh, these are modic design FPSOs. So the FPSO turret um, is the, the two turret mooring systems operate in a weather waning mode, facing to the uh, oncoming environment and minimizing external forces, waves, and wind and current by rotating around a turret bearing system, enabling safe and stable operation, even in harsh weather conditions, be it in the North Sea or the Gulf of Mexico, West Africa, uh, Brazilian waters, you know, uh, West, Western Australian waters. The second type of FPSO are the cylindrical circular FPSOs. Um, these are very new designs, only Sevan Marine, Design circular FPSO. Seven Marine is also a subsidiary of Simcoe Marine. So basically, there is no turret, there is no internal or external turret. Basically, this cylindrical FPSO acts as a turret. Uh, so it has it uses the spread mooring principle, as you can see, uh, incorporating a number of mooring lines attached to the hull of the vessel. These mooring lines are anchored on the seabed. Very cost effective design, but construction is very, very challenging due to the circular hull, dimension control, and the limited space on the deck for topside integration. Some of the recently constructed um, FPSOs, on the right-hand side, you can see the Goliath FPSO construction in South Korea, the largest cylindrical FPSO so far. Then on the right is Western Isles, the red FPSO construct in China. Then on the bottom, you see Voyage uh, Spirit and Shell Penguins. Shell Penguins still under construction in China. So this is a very, uh, uh, this is the newest, uh, very uh, popular design for FPSOs. I would think in the in this decade, we will see a number of new FPSOs coming. Actually, I'm working on 
uh, new FPSO, cylindrical FPSO, and it's a very interesting uh, project. So the main benefits of the hull of an FPSO, of a cylindrical hull FPSO is uh, there, are, there is no weather varying because the hull is facing the environment with same shape in all directions. So no need to rotate, eliminating turret and swivel. So there's no turret. So the cylindrical hull rotates by itself. The capital length expenditure saving, the cost of turret, swivel, and thrusters is avoided. We don't need a turret, so it's cost effective. Operation expenditure saving because re reducing requirement for marine crew, fuel consumption spares, uh, increased flexibility, spare capacity for tie-ins or future risers. Then um, the insignificant uh, 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 bending stresses due to global loads on the hull also eliminating wave induced fatigues uh, that we see on a normal ship shaped FPS is eliminated in a cylindrical hull FPS. So with minimal hull deflection, sag, hog, simplifying topside interface. Then the lower pitch roll motions, uh, they reduce, they lead to reduce fatigue and stress. So basically a circular FPS, so minimal pitch roll motions suitable for permanent mooring and higher lifetime more than 30 years. Uh, ship shape like uh, FPS was explained earlier, costly turret, higher bending stress, lifetime less than 25 years usually. So the superior pitch roll characteristics as you see in this graph, uh, lead on a Sivan type cylindrical FPS, so leading to improved uptime and longer lifetime in harsh environments. So basically, this is a normal design of a cylindrical FPSO, hull diameter on an average uh, 93, bilge box diameter 124, uh, uh, bilge box plate diameter 138, main deck 103 uh, meters wide, process deck diameter 109. Uh, the top size weight 30,000 tons on average. The hull, I would say, is around roughly 40,000 tons, 40 to 50,000 tons. So, Basically, you can understand you need a large, uh, wide dry dock to construct such FPS source. Um, the hull design, you can see the water ballast tanks are out on the outer edge of the design. Then the outer cargo tanks followed by inside, then the inner cargo tanks and the coffer dam where the moon pool rises go through. Then the top side a layout is with, you get the process area. Unlike the ship ship FPSO where you get number of modules, the process area is quite uh, stacked up, uh, unique design, uh, moon pool where the risers go and are connected to the seabed, uh, to the subsea system, offloading is behind, uh, the blast wall, lifeboat accommodation, plus the flare tower for the gas exhaust. Moon pool arrangement, again, you can see right in the middle of the FPSO, uh, the risers uh, go through uh, connected to the subsea systems. So some of the pictures I have collected from uh, FPSO constructed in China, uh, sorry, in South Korea. Um, as you can see, a uh, large dry docks unit with uh, wide, uh, at least you need 100 meter wide uh, dry docks, which with, uh, with the crane, edge, a crane tonnage of at least, I uh, would say 5,000 to 10,000 tons. Uh, so limited shipyards due to size and right of crane capability capable of constructing cylindrical hull FPSOs. The construction is very challenging due to dimensional control on the hull and topside integration due to the circular main deck area with limited space. You know, the you can see on the bottom uh, right hand corner, the top, top side deck area has limited space uh, during integration compared to a ship shaped FPSO. So I'll cover a bit about materials and welding during construction. Um, so during construction of an FPSO, there are various code standards that govern an FPSO. So basically the hull of, I would say, uh, most of the FPSOs are constructed on the DMV offshore rules or ABS offshore rules. These two are the leading classifications for FPSO constructions. In fact, for offshore oil and gas, I would say DMV is number one in the world now. Uh, the top side structures are very stringent requirements with 100% NDT requirements uh, like UT, PAUT, RT on all CJPs. We follow D1.1, ISO 1902, NOSOP M101 as part of the construction standards for top side structure. 
client specifications are addendums to the above three, such as Mordic, Techni, uh, ExxonMobil, Shell, Wood, BW Offshore, BP, SBM, et cetera. Piping for the Highland top side, usually ASME, ASME ISO, API 1104 for risers, NOSOC M601 for Norwegian continental shelf FPSOs, um, NACE MR0175 for server service piping. Um, then when we come to, uh, there are various grades, material grades used for the construction of the FPSO hull top side and the turret. High structural steels, high strength steels, extra high strength steels. I mean, thickness ranging between, on average, between 30 millimeters till you get until 100 millimeters is very common. Um, uh, we use the top side structures and design temperatures, API 2W grade 50, grade 60, uh, European grades S355, S420, S460, S600 are the grades used for the top side structure, uh, top side module construction with design temperatures of minus 40. Uh, CTOD fracture testing on uh, PQR procedure welding qualifications are quite common uh, for high thickness product uh, welding procedures, very challenging. Um, piping, we use a lot of exotic piping for um, uh, FPSOs. I mean, uh, piping plays a very integral part. We have uh, stainless steel 316, duplex, super duplex, stainless steels, six moly, inconel 625, titanium, aluminum brass, copper nickel, 4130 for risers, inconel cladding. Uh, duplex, super duplex, often we, we have a lot of, I mean, corrosion is a very challenge. Corrosion uh, mitigation is a challenge for all FPSOs during construction because of the high life expansion until 30 years. So corrosion testing is common on all the duplex, super duplex, six moly piping. We had to qualify the welding procedures with this requirement. Stress corrosion cracking, again, also testing as per names for most of the materials on the SAW service. So uh, yeah, so basically this is my presentation I covered for the construction of FPS source. Uh, uh, I hope uh, you all gathered something with my presentation. Uh, thanks EDB for the opportunity. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, Dr. Indrajit. Thank you, Mr. Raving, for... Uh, Dr. Indrajit, I will uh, also request uh, Harsha, sorry, Kapila to make it short about the subsea technology. Now, Dr. Sorry, Ravi, explain about the FPSO and the modules to be installed, and it fairly well covers the offshore platform structure as well as FPSO's floating structures. Uh, can Kapila give a very short brief about the subsea technology which has been developed in Norway, especially by Arca Engineering? Ravi, uh, Kapila? Uh, thank you, Sarat. Yes, make I think it short, uh, Ravi... Make it short, Kapila, please. Thank you. Time is running out. Thank you, sir. Hold on. I just try to get the screen. Uh, right. Here we go. Right. Yeah, I just uh, try to uh, capture a few uh, things from Subsea because uh, Ravi actually uh, taken into quite a lot of uh, specific details on the uh, top, uh, top side structures. Let's see, just summarize a few things and the brief introduction to offshore oil and gas production installations based especially on the subsea benefits and differentiation of subsea technology. A few examples of subsea systems from Norwegian continental shelf and design and engineering service providers, especially for offshore structures. Uh, Takla design software, especially competency building part. Uh, we'll uh, capture a little bit more on that part. Yeah, I think that this picture, I don't want to uh, repeat it again. I think uh, Ravin captured the few items and especially the, uh, the Norwegian sector quite uh, quite a lot on the floating, uh, especially on the uh, semi uh, uh, Doctor Actually, uh, we can't see the screen, so we have to share. Sorry? Uh, we can't screen. see the screen. Dr. Kapila, okay. can you insert the screen? Yeah, hold on. 
Yeah, I think, all right, yes. So you go, sorry for that. And I think I completely missed. Can you see that now? Yes, yes. Okay, okay sorry for that. I think I uh, missed that. Uh, Quickly go through, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm actually showing the uh, not right set. Hold on. Right. I'll go back a couple of slides. Here we go. Can you see that now? Yeah, we can. Go through. Please. Okay, yeah. Summary of the talk. Brief introduction to uh, offshore oil and gas production installations. And I don't go very deep into that because I think uh, Ravin captured the uh, few slides. Benefits and differentiation of subsea technology. And a few examples from Norwegian continental shelf. Design and engineering service providers, offshore structures. And go to Tecla design software part. Uh, quickly on the on the uh, last few slides. Um, this image, I think uh, Ravin has uh, spoken it uh, before, so I will uh, I will go through quickly on the eight and nine. Uh, these basically seven and eight are the one mostly semi-submersible stuff in the Norwegian North Sea uh, offshore uses as um, roughly around three thousand meter water depth uh, up to the uh, maximum. And FPS source, of course, Saravin has explained pretty much. So those are these images here is actually from uh, um, the uh, subsea units uh, with a lot of uh, cluster uh, wellheads. Right, subsea production system is uh, is a fully submerged ocean equipment operations and applications installed for distance offshore wells. Uh, units are placed on the seabed, and uh, these production systems are located on the seafloor, just as in FPS case. Um, Floating production uh, storage. Petroleum is extracted at the seafloor and then tied back to uh, existing uh, uh, platforms. So here are the excuse major components. Me, uh, well, had... excuse me, Doctor Kapil. Actually, we yeah. are only seeing the first slide now. Really? Yeah. Oh, why it's, it's happening there again? I shared my oh, screen. Can I can you see, see that? We, we can see only the first uh, slide. You have to move really? the, you have to start playing the uh, PowerPoint. Yeah, I just uh, did actually. Manuel, can you see that? No, it is only the first slide. slide. No? Only the no, first are, slide. Yeah, I think you have to share it again because we are seeing the whatever you are. Google Chrome or something. PowerPoint one. Yeah, I think it's a two screen I'm playing that's uh, probably is causing some issues. Uh... With all the troubles, I think. Uh, Manoja, sorry, Kapila, can EDB start play the PowerPoint and you can explain? Yeah. Can, you, can you see that now? We no, can see only the uh, first slide. You need Maybe? to stop sharing and then uh, we share the things, I guess. Oh, okay, I will do that. Right now? It's coming up. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I know it's fine. Go okay. fast. Thank you. Right. So, okay. I just uh, talk a little bit on the uh, on this subsea production systems. And this one, I actually try to skip that because Ravin actually spoke on this uh, very different part of uh, subsea uh, units as well as the you on the uh, exactly what are the installations. I'll skip that uh, and then go to subsea uh, production systems. Especially what is subsea? Subsea is actually all the units actually uh, are placed on the uh, sea, sea bottom, and they're interconnected to uh, one of the host uh, platforms. And the major component of the subsea unit is a wellhead, subsea trees. I actually uh, put uh, small uh, icon figures there to, to understand. Client systems, intervention and well control systems, umbilical, or this is a connection wires to the, uh, the control units and, and to the subsea uh, sections, and the control systems. So this is actually two different uh, uh, 
semantic diagram showing exactly what is the cross section of the uh, the unit place on the uh, C as well as in the show, and this is an uh, artistic view of the same on the uh, on the left side. So if I look at it, it is sub C units. Those are actually on the red circles, and on the uh, show uh, units is actually uh, on the uh, the blue circles, and the FPS source and all the uh, surface mount uh, storage facilities actually on the yellow circle. Benefits and differentiation subsea systems, um, cost-effective downstream operations from multiple producing wells, because there are quite a lot of uh, multiple producing wells coming with the uh, different part of the reservoirs, and they should be connected to each other to get into the uh, system to the uh, host, uh, hosting facilities like in the float submersible or the uh, or the stationary uh, platforms. Producing wells are connected through subsea to uh, show FPSOs, subsea to tie back to existing facilities, subsea processing solution with fixed platforms and new floating facilities, as well as onshore units. As you can see the pictures on the uh, offshore units. And reduce operational risk with the separate building blocks. And that's, uh, as you see on the right bottom on the section where we have a lot of uh, subsea units connected to systems. Unmanned and remotely operating units uh, with minimized maintenance. Additional benefits, I don't want to go through the detail, but uh, the benefit uh, is actually reduced cost and the technical maneuverability. And when it comes to uh, placing them on the bits and pieces uh, on, this, on the subsea, they are actually uh, having all the hazardous situations reduced and environmentally minimize the footprint, uh, environmental footprint. And here are some uh, subsea well structures. As you can see, the satellite is a single well uh, um, far away from the main host uh, platform. And the cluster is actually a single wellhead with the different well tops connected to each to, uh, to the manifold and then to the uh, hosting uh, platform. And here is a four wheel template. And mostly, uh, if you already know, we are pretty much interested in uh, four wheel templates. They are how the six wheel templates connect to the number of bits and pieces of the reservoir sections. Subsea examples from Norwegian control shelf. And you can see this, uh, this is actually from tieback uh, installation from, uh, from one of the uh, Ikinor fields. It's called uh, Bredeback. Bredeback has several uh, reservoir sections and they are all interconnected with the six well uh, templates. The water depth 130 here, 23 producing wells and four subsea platform uh, templates and one umbilical hydraulic chemicals and hydraulic system. They are all connected. You can see all the uh, subsea uh, templates. And there, another example from Maria Field is the operator is Wintershell. Uh, this is one of the uh, most advanced subsea units uh, operating in the uh, offshore Norway. And the distance from subsea unit to the uh, hosting platform is roughly 40 kilometers, and some FPS source is about 20 kilometers far away. So they are quite a station far away to uh, to ease to maintain and ease to uh, in hazardous situation, you can actually uh, disconnect them as well. And some of the uh, uh, templates and subsea units, uh, especially for Christine and Oscar, I don't want to go into very detail, but uh, specifically, this is a very famous one, it's, uh, it's a Christine South uh, unit, and the Laverance project is actually from Arco Solution to Statoil. Design and engineering service providers. Yeah, I have actually listed a few. Subsea design and delivery of offshore. Subsea 7 is one of the uh, great uh, suppliers here in, in, the, in the North Sea. And one subsea design, construction, and maintenance of all marine subsea structures. Arca Solutions uh, is one of the uh, key suppliers here for globally and uh, as well as in the uh, Norwegian continental shelf. Fanfa Group is actually it's a Norwegian as well. It's uh, located in, in Oslo. Baker Engineering, Design and Engineering Construction. ABB and DNV are also actually carrying on design and engineering. And I want to specifically mention about uh, Tekla Company, which is actually providing uh, training and software supply as well. Subsea, I just try to capture a few things, and they are worldwide deliveries for concept designing, engineering, FAQ, and fabricate. I install commissioning, maintain and extend decommissioning uh, as well. 
behaves arc solutions. They are located here, um, right across a couple of kilometers away from my home here. It employs 15,000, 53 locations, operational locations, and they are also more towards the renewable energy solutions as well in recent years. A quite active company and especially operating in offshore Brazil as well. And for group, I think uh, this is a slide I received recently. The operational experience we have about 2001 to 2018 delivered quite many projects to the uh, uh, EPC projects to uh, offshore industries. And, and they are actually located here in Norway as well, quite a lot of operational bases outside. I just want to look at in the Tecla design software competency building as a training. So Tecla company is actually headquartered in, uh, in Finland and they're operating worldwide and quite a lot of uh, work in the Far East as well, in Singapore, Malaysia, uh, and India as well. And the nearest, of course, Singapore for us for, for any training purposes. And they're actually quite uh, quite good. And I contacted them for one of the, uh, the meetings recently, and they took that uh, in, uh, invitation uh, okay, and they actually confirmed that they have presentation on 30th of September at 10 o'clock UK time, 2.30 p.m. SL time. Further details are available in a separate broadcast and with an invitation. I think uh, we all uh, would like to invite all the uh, listeners today to join this presentation with Tecla. I think that's all for me. I quickly ran through uh, to save the time. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kapila, for that uh, informative session uh, on the offshore industry again. And uh, Dr. Sarath, obviously. Yes, uh, Dr. Sanka, uh, we were supposed to have Dr. Chandima Ratnayaka on, uh, on this reliability and maintenance part. I think he has been called for a lecture gently. So let yeah, me- Yeah, I think he, he, he told me today that he's uh, pretty busy, yes. so unable to- According to the- uh, program he was supposed to give a small presentation i i'll try to give a little explanation of what we expect i'll share the screen uh, I'll share the screen give me a second please Can you see the screen? Yeah, we can see the screen. I'll briefly go through what I have been trying to say has been already detailed by other members. Uh, let me open this up. Uh, can you see the screen, please? Yes. Can you see uh, the we only see the folder, not the presentation. Now you can see the presentation? No. I think you have share. to share the presentation. Yeah, let me share that. Where do I share that? I think uh, you need to stop sharing and then uh, we share the presentation. Okay, share. Share. Can you see that now? No, actually, not the presentation. Double click on Sarath. Let me share it again. Sorry about the... Uh, First, you I, can open the presentation and then share it, I think. Okay, let me do that.
And yeah, you can see that. You can see only the first first slide. Can't you see the? We are not seeing the screen yet. Now we have a share. And the share damn thing is. Yeah, share damn thing. Right now we are seeing the screen and the presentation. Yes, uh, can you see that? Now I'm trying to quickly go through, but what I have been trying to say in the, anyway, before I start my short presentation, I'll explain to you the role of our subcommittee headed by Dr. Indrajit and which was formed under the main advisory board on the enthusiasm and the drive from the EDB. I am the chairman of that, uh, advisory committee gazetted, and then we have the subcommittee. Now idea in trying to educate and make the knowledge available worldwide, I have been able to mobilize people like Kapila, Dr. Kapila, Dr. Harsha, Dr. Chandima in various part of the world. And also I had some contacts with uh, Dubai dry docks where people, are, Sri Lankans are heavily involved in this industry. Idea is to <clears throat> explain the uh, technology used, utilized, and developed all over the world. And Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, academia, and a lot of people are not aware of these technologies. These particular presentations will help the academia in Sri Lanka, universities. Uh, headed by Dr. Indrajit and Dr. and from Marine University, Dr. Jagat, you can you can modify your curriculum to train young engineers so that they are ready to either go abroad, gather more information, and come back. Now you can see in Dubai, I'll show you a brief presentation of Dubai, most probably how they have evolved from a simple ship repair company into a major role player in the offshore industry. Despite the fact that Dubai doesn't have much of oil or gas like other countries. And again, same to Singapore. Singapore also 30 years back, 35 years back when we were visiting, we were seeing a very low level technology in shipyards <clears throat> and some shipyards were making uh, weaponry and stuff like that. Now, as Ravin explained, you can see the the, the development in those countries. So I'll skip the first few uh, uh, slides and you can see strategic location of Sri Lanka along the busy route between uh, Dubai and Singapore. We think Sri Lanka should develop the offshore industry in the design, construction, project management, and train our engineers so that they can get involved in the local industry when LNG starts coming in, in downstream and also upstream. Now, uh, most of the industry in Scandinavia, UK and many consultancy companies based in those countries have moved to places like Singapore because of the steadily, steady increase in uh, cost. But we have not been able to capture that market. Most of them went to Singapore they are in Malaysia, they are in India. Companies which I will list in, in this uh, presentation, uh, I can tell why we have to request them to come to Sri Lanka to establish this design project management offices, these consultancy firms. They can come to Port City or any other location in Colombo and connection with Trincomalee will help them to uh, develop the offshore industry. And I can, I'm listing, I'm not going to read everything, availability of high computer literacy and various other facilities in Sri Lanka. This is our intention to develop this industry. Now, existing development in the offshore sector, you have heard what Preeni said, but Preeni has given a very good presentation on the need to develop or train engineers in those fields. So in addition to their curriculum in engineering, uh, in every university in the mechanical uh, discipline, chemical engineering, civil and structural, uh, 
uh, instrumentation, fire and safety, all those uh, disciplines to be incorporated into the current curriculum. And I have been invited lately for the new uh, faculty formation of marine and marine engineering in the Kotalawala Defense Academy. And I suggested strongly that in that nautical engineering or marine engineering faculty, they should include few subjects related to offshore engineering. Like Ravin said, the youngsters should learn, know about those codes and standards and the high level of welding with various copper nickel combinations and duplex steel combinations in those constructions and the corrosion protection on those uh, 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 structures. So we have to give some education in that area. And uh, capacity building in offshore industry, service industry is what I am trying to elaborate so that Dr. Indrajit and their team can promote the educational side so that we have blue collar and white collar uh, finance and financial experts ready. Then we can also invite foreign universities in Stavanger in Norway, in Scotland, even from uh, uh, West Indies. They can come here and start having joint collaboration and with the new trend on because of the COVID situation, a lot of things have developed in the area of uh, remote education, like the webinar we are conducting. You can teach students, give lectures remotely from those countries, and we can join up with those universities. That initiative has to, take, has to be taken by the government with the university grant commission and have a separate uh, marketing unit or a uh, coordination sector so that you can incorporate their courses with ours. And uh, I have just listed uh, I listed this type of experts we can train, but Prini has given a much better uh, presentation on how many, what type of people we can train. In the side photographs, you can see, uh, I'm happy to say that I was enrolled in the very construction of the very first stat fjord a uh, concrete uh, uh, three leg platform and the civil engineering and the structural engineering disciplines can learn what type of software we were using to develop these structures. It is not like those days you don't do manual calculations. Now, uh, now everything is, uh, all these structures are developed through software. They are 3D dimensional, the interface and all those things are all developed through software walk through software like that. In this, uh, 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 again, this is the just type of people we can train. And uh, in Stratford Day, the platform I was just telling you, I think Dr. Ratnavir also mentioned the size of these big platforms and how, how many of the living quarters, helic deck, drilling platform and the crude oil uh, clearing. I mean, not clear, crude oil, processing, like removal of CO2, mud, water, sand, everything integrated into this st structure mounted on these three legs. That is what we were designing. Now, I am trying to, uh, I just gave a list of, one second, if you can don't mind, I have to stop for a moment, just to buy. Uh, 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 hydrocarbon processing uh, after extraction, you have to remove gas, condensate, oil, water with dissolved minerals. All those processes, what I've been listed, are uh, built in, in box-like modules, like Ravin explained. Now, good old days when we were building this in Norway, modules were built in either Scotland, France, and elsewhere. And they were brought in and mounted on those 
platform. So the opportunity we have in Sri Lanka is to develop Rincomali as the nucleus for this industry. So, and with the water depth, I am sure we can uh, have companies invested in those uh, industries. Now, these are the target consultancy companies which one, one or two were mentioned by previous speakers. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sarath, Sarath, actually, uh, we are running out of time. Can you quickly yes. go through? Quickly, yes. Now, these are the things, what, these are the companies which we need to invite to Sri Lanka to establish their offices and, and uh, develop our industry in Sri Lanka. I'm not going to go through all the slices. This is a, just a simple organization chart, what we were managing. You have a project manager and all the other disciplines. And that is project management consultants who can be trained or those in companies can come establish their offices. And then we have the engineering and uh, uh, procurement companies. They can also start who will be monitored by project management. So the experts for these can be trained in Sri Lanka. So I'll, I'll wind up with this and I will, I'm just trying to say that the necessity to bring those companies that knowledge with those companies to establish their offices and also the construction side, like Ravin said, we should try to develop Singapore. So Singapore, like Singapore, we have to develop drink company. I'll wind up on this on my presentation. And as running, time is running out, I will place the other presentation from Norwegian company and how do I evolved for everybody to see in the YouTube channel of EDD? Thank you, Dr. Nisa. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sarat. Okay. Uh, can you stop sharing, please? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Nisa. Sorry for the rush, but I have to let the others. Uh, no. Yes, yeah, sure. Actually, uh, last time when I could not introduce the two speakers. Uh, Mr. Ravin Vijayaratna, again, a welding engineer and a project a quality lead, Simba Corp, Marine Limited, Singapore. And he has a vast experience in this uh, FESO design and building. And uh, without, because of the time limitation, I'm not going to go into all the details. And then Dr. Sarath Obeseker, CEO, founder of Opus Colombo Shipyard. And again, he has a vast experience in the offshore oil and gas industry. Uh, in Sri Lanka and overseas and so thank you for the very enlightening presentations for both of you and the next uh, we are moving on to our last session and uh, yes, again uh, this will be presented by Dr. Hasha Ratnavira, uh, Professor in Water Technology, Norwegian University of Life Sciences and uh, then uh, we have the other speaker Dr. Prasanna Gunwardhana from the uh, University of Peradeni Department of Mechanical Engineering where this session will be dedicated for the environmental uh, side of these uh, projects as well as the renewable energy developments. So without taking further time, so I will hand over to uh, Dr. Harsha to continue the presentation. Good afternoon. I hope that you can see my sh screen. Yes, Dr. Atman, we can see. Yes, okay. Um, I think it's great that uh, um, uh, this uh, webinar was organized and I'm, uh, it is an honor for me to participate in this webinar. So I'm going to talk a few words about the environmental risks, prevention and remediation, uh, how in general it's uh, done. Um, so we know that all these activities are um, uh, related to one or the other kind of risks. Um, so if we look at this picture, it shows the, the 10, uh, the largest accidents which happened during the last uh, decade also. And we see the red numbers show that uh, the number of uh, casualties, the human deaths. But in addition to that, there are a lot of other damages it's causing, right? And uh, during the last uh, couple of months, uh, Sri Lanka has awakened to a number of uh, um, shocking news 
um, in a way they are unexpected, but on the other hand, they should have been expected when we are working, when you are in this business. So I'm going to briefly say a few things about how these are uh, planned and managed. The, the key word is the awareness and preparedness. So when we are developing these type of projects, it's quite common to consider the potential impacts, human uh, impact on humans, atmospheric, aquatic nature, terrestrial, cultural, and socioeconomic. On top of that, the emergencies are happening. So we need to know about this and we have to have prepared, well prepared for this uh, type of activities. So here are some examples of how to prevent uh, the risks and manage them. Legislations, management systems, leadership and commitment, policies and strategic objectives, organization, evaluation of risk management and planning, training and monitoring and auditing. The last one is very, very important. So um, I know that uh, the, the Envoyant, uh, Marine Environmental Prevention Authority is working on this. So it's important that these are considered in their work the future. And uh, the, there, we can divide operational practices and procedures into two sections because these are natural parts of the whole process of risk prevention activities. Um, and as you can see from the slide, uh, these are common parts of any project in the oil and gas activity. And then if something happens, we need to be prepared how to deal with that. So remediation, there are physical methods, chemical methods, biological methods, and thermal methods. And on to the right, you see 10 of the most common methods to deal with oil spill cleanup at the sea. So uh, I'm sorry that for this very brief presentation because in one minute I have to go for another lecture. So thank you very much. And I hope that we can have an elaborative session later on this topic. Thank you and goodbye. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Acharat Navira for that uh, very encouraging presentations regarding the environmental aspect, uh, aspects where we are currently facing one or seeing one of the uh, disastrous events that happened. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to go into the last speaker, Dr. Freshan Gunawardhan, can you? Yes, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Prasanna, I think you are muted. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I think all of you can hear me. Yeah, it is an honor for me to participate in this uh, event and thank you for uh, giving me this chance uh, to present this one. So actually from oil to environment and then coming back to uh, renewable energy is a, is a good combination as I suppose. And uh, actually, <clears throat> Uh, I will, uh, Doc, uh, Ms. Preeni uh, told a uh, few things about renewable energy and the importance. So I will continue from that point. And actually, uh, according to Sri Lankan plans, actually we are heading towards 100% uh, renewable energy power generation uh, in times to come. Uh, and it is given uh, 2050. Uh, but I'm also not sure about these numbers and the dates, but however, uh, the renewable energy contributions are going to increase. So that uh, whenever we are talking about renewable energies, basically the solar, wind, hydro, and all these kinds of things are coming up. But of course, uh, there are plenty of other opportunities in uh, offshore and the, and the marine renewable energy sector. So uh, if you look at the investment, uh, investment that uh, uh, the predicted investment for that thing is about uh, uh, more than 50 uh, US dollars uh, in times to come. So there will be huge potential to grab on uh, that field. So since uh, this, the main topic is pa paradigm shift, so we'll have to consider uh, very positively the marine renewable energy sector as well. So in that light, uh, 
I will quickly go through these things. Uh, now this uh, shows uh, the number of companies uh, in particularly uh, global, uh, uh, particularly Bev energy companies. If you look at uh, offshore uh, renewable energies, then Bev energy and ocean thermal energy and offshore wind energy uh, and tidal energy. Uh, and also sal salinity gradient and so on. So there are there are many things are there. So I'm only focusing on wave energy because uh, uh, when we consider Sri Lanka, we have a uh, compared to others, wave energy is having a kind of a high potential uh, to develop. Uh, so there are global uh, uh, energy companies. When you look at, there are quite a large number of companies are there. Anyway, so then uh, we will look at uh, the, the European wave energy projects. Now we can see that they are rapidly growing. So it, it means that uh, uh, this, uh, this wave energy and uh, ocean renewable energy uh, developments are rapidly growing. So therefore, uh, we'll have to look at uh, what we'll have to do and uh, how we are going to grab this opportunity as Sri Lankans. So if you look at uh, some of the devices, I'm not going to discuss anything here, but just to show you about uh, certain, certain devices are there. So unlike uh, wind turbines, there are quite a lot of variants are there. So in, because of that reason, uh, the, the wave energy, particularly it is not a mature technology up to date. So it is almost like pre-commercial stage. So that is very important point to be highlighted here. So keep in mind that, uh, and uh, then along with that, there are quite a number of uh, quarries and also people are interested in Sri Lanka to develop uh, their own products and all these things are coming up time to time. So in uh, 2016, there's a, uh, Carnegie, uh, that is Australian company, wanted to have some wave energy plants here in Sri Lanka, and also Sri Lankan government and Finland government had a discussion and all the uh, the visits and also on to develop uh, wave energy in Sri Lanka, and also Wave Pro, that is uh, Israel company, came here and they also wanted to have uh, some wave energy project uh, here in Sri Lanka. So so many things are are happening. Uh, so, but uh, now, are we ready, really? So, are we ready, really? So, there are there are a few other things also, and also Sri Lanka Sustainable Energy Authority request proposals, uh, the commissioning and operation of exotic energy technologies in Sri Lanka, under that, we have energy also included, so that uh, the Sri Lankan government also requesting uh, potential developers to come and develop uh, wave energy here in Sri Lanka. But only if the conditions are correct. So the people are coming or because since uh, in Sri Lanka, we don't have any particular concrete or um, any particular company to develop wave energy by themselves. So mostly we are looking for overseas developers. So, but if the conditions are correct, they are coming. And it should be better than elsewhere. To get the inward investment, in Sri Lanka. So, in that sense, uh, we need we need to develop uh, our policies and all that. So, the government commitment should be there, and uh, we need to have a detailed strategic plan and also uh, strategic instruments. So, under strategic instrument, uh, supportive policies should be there, and industrial outreach and research and development program. And, uh, and uh, in, in that sense, uh, really we need to have something like uh, ocean test facility, something like that. So I will come in to discuss uh, that one later on. And uh, then only we can get the inward investments and uh, then that will uh, create the national development. So that uh, since this is an emerging technology and the area, so we need, uh, need those things to be aligned in order to uh, develop uh, this sector. So then, uh, so that uh, actually we can develop uh, 
towards us friendly renewable energies uh, and so on so uh, then i will quickly go to uh, some of the things that we have done and, and as well as uh, some some part of uh, the renewable energy road map uh, uh, in sri lanka uh, so any any energy or renewable energy whatever uh, it is uh, the resource is very important so we have completed uh, renewable uh, the wave energy resource assessment uh, here in sri lanka with the support of uh, sri lanka sustainable energy authority and uh, ocean thermal energy and tidal energy etc we haven't done it uh, of course uh, as i know that the potentials are uh, not that much and also we have established sri lanka marine renewable energy association in 2017 um, and uh, also now in order to achieve certain things uh, we 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 are we kept on proposing uh, creation of marine renewable energy research and development test center in sri lanka uh, why we are proposing this is to reduce some of the most significant barriers to develop uh, uh, wave energy devices or the testing because of uh, if we have a dedicated test site then of course it is possible the investors and the developers to come and test their product here at a cost and then if that is a good product of course we can deploy or, or we can participate in manufacturing and uh, fabrication and all that kind of things at the same time we can charge a certain cost uh, for their testing here in sri lanka so that is a kind of a opportunity with a minimal investment so that will create uh, opportunities and also it, it can, we can uh, build the capacity of the research and development sector as well as uh, local industries and also academia in uh, I mean, ac- ac- academia as well so we have done a wave energy resource assessment around sri lanka uh, in sri lanka actually we don't have very energetic sea we have moderate the energetic sea and also the other one is uh, it is uh, the the wave heights are not that high so therefore uh, those uh, who are interested in sri lanka are having a good opportunity to design they can optimize the designs because the the objects or the devices are facing uh, a moderate forces so therefore this is particularly good uh, for uh particularly developers to test their facilities this is a uh, sri lankan water is is a good place uh, since uh, it is kind of a moderately energetic and uh, this is a kind of artistic impression or the concept of a wave energy uh, ocean test center so this is uh, this is arbitrary selected position actually this is uh this is only taken to illustrate only so let's look at what are the facilities required so of course we need a designated region and also wave energy measurement site and we need subsea cables and few anchored locations and a uh, shoreline switch gear and office uh, just to connect with the grid and uh, also lookout positions uh, and and so on so basically if you look at this one this is not a big uh, physical facility but of course we need some sea cables and a, and a station there with grid connectivity and designated area of course if a, a device is placed somewhere there then of course the other activities also could happen in parallel uh, so that uh, any government entity or whatever organization can take up as this as a kind of a, an opportunity and uh, try to develop this kind of a thing and uh, now we have published a paper uh, in vidulka national energy symposium uh, in 2017 it includes uh, all the details and the costing etc so those who are interested i can share with uh, share share that paper with you all so it, it gives certain idea behind uh, what is uh, this kind of a test center and so on so in that sense uh, i'll conclude my presentation uh, 
because of uh, in Sri Lanka, because we are going uh, heading towards 100% uh, renewable energy. So in that case, of course, we'll have to expedite uh, the exploitation of solar and wind throughout the country, but there are limitations. So therefore, we need to go for some other options. Uh, wave energy and ocean renewable energy are one of the options. So, <clears throat> uh, and also uh, we all know that energy mix during the nighttime also, it can produce energy. So therefore, uh, if you're considering a fully renewable energy system, then the energy mix is also very important. So thereby, we definitely will have to go for uh, like uh, ocean renewable energy along with the others as well. And uh, uh, now the other important thing that I highlight is actually marine energy is still pre-commercial stage. So th there are a lot of developments are happening. So therefore by making a small investment to test site and so on, we can attract uh, developers in other countries to come and test their devices uh, here in Sri Lanka. Why I'm telling this is, if you want to hire the similar kind of test centers in Europe, it is very costly. So of course, uh, according to our calculation, one fifth of the European cost, uh, we can facilitate it with a profit. So therefore, this is a, uh, this is a kind of opportunity. So I'm not telling that Wave Energy will have to develop around the country, but of course, as initiative, we can have this kind of a test center attached to any of a marine related organization in Sri Lanka. Uh, Rukuna University also developing a faculty and uh, there are Fishery Harbor Corporation and some other, even Navy and all that. They have their own territories and all that. So they can find out a good place and, and then they can develop. And also we highlighted in the paper that uh, the return on investment uh, is fairly shorter. So uh, anyone interested, then it is possible to develop a uh, wave energy test center here in Sri Lanka. So we can give uh, the support as academics in the university. So thank you very much. So that is about my presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prasanna Gunawardhana for that informative session on the marine wave energy and the Sri Lankan perspectives. So with that, our line of presentations are over and uh, we have uh, several questions raised. So I would like to take a brief uh, Q&A session. Uh, okay, so for this session, if you're not present, can you? Yeah. You're sharing, please. And for this uh, Q&A session also, we have Mr. Prince Lai, the head of uh, shipbuilding and marketing in Colombo, Tokyat PLC also joining. So I'll also like to direct some questions to him as well. And uh, the first question actually is, uh, in Sri Lanka, we have many marine engineers who would like to gain more knowledge and hands on experience in the industries. Can they involve in these projects and gain experience? Uh, I'd like to direct these questions to our resource persons coming from the, in the industry, like uh, Mr. Prince Lai or Mr. Ricky Barnett or Dr. Sarah Tobesegger. Um, good, uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Indrajit. Thank you for the question. I couldn't actually follow the question uh, completely. I can repeat it, yeah. Yes, please. Uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, we have many marine engineers who would like to gain more knowledge and hands-on experience in these industries. Can they involve in the these projects and gain experience? So it's basically asking whether he, we have any opportunities for them to involve in some projects related to this industry. Yes, uh, yes, Dr. No. Good question. Uh, actually speaking, uh, we as the shipbuilder, the pioneer shipbuilder in Sri Lanka, we do a lot of uh, shipbuilding activities and mainly uh, to the um, uh, upstream uh, uh, upstream market. Uh, as you know, 
we have built and delivered more than 24 uh, offshore support vessels to the oil and gas industry. Uh, and these vessels are operating in various uh, parts of uh, oil hotspots in the world, in Petronas, Petrobras, in Sahalin area, in Bombay High, then uh, South China Sea, and uh, likewise. So these are very uh, sophisticated and complicated vessels. Uh, each vessel will cost you about 25 million US dollars. So we have actually built and delivered to various uh, uh, clients overseas, these kind of vessels. So these are actually vessels with uh, a lot of uh, sophistication. Uh, like uh, they have like uh, very sophisticated uh, powering systems. Some are even equipped with battery power, that is with uh, hybrid technology and all that. And also uh, various other uh, pollution controls, firefighting systems, uh, uh, cargo carrying capacities and all that. So definitely uh, there is a high demand for our marine engineers to uh, get involved in the uh, sector, uh, not only for shipbuilding, as you know, we are also a ship repair yard. So there's so many, uh, you know, we repair about 200 ships a year. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, potential and there is a dearth in the, uh, you know, marine engineers joining because some of them, you know, after getting their degrees, they maybe go uh, work abroad or migrate. So, uh, we are finding it very difficult to find uh, good quality people to Sri Lanka. Dr. Yes, Nisanka, yes. can I yes, add a few words? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Prince Sai, for that informa information. And Dr. Saratabh Besegra, please continue. Now, uh, question is very clear. Enthusiastic marine engineers who are trained in shipbuilding, ship repair, and uh, designing is little different from the offshore industry we are talking about. Of course, there's an element of nautical engineering, marine engineering involved in this FPSO design and things like that, as Ravin explained. Now, the, a few years back, I'll very, 34 years back when uh, during Sir, uh, Mrs. Bandar Naik's government, they started fertilizer cooperation, petroleum cooperation, semen, uh, plywood cooperation, all the people who were employed were local graduates or graduates from Russia and all over. They trained themselves. Unfortunately, when these factories shut down, everybody in block went to Middle East. So they got expanded experience. Unfortunately, we don't have such projects coming up unless if in the LNG project comes up or the LNG power plant comes up, there's a program by these companies to uh, initiate some uh, training programs for those marine engineers to give you inside knowledge of what is happening. For example, material technology, welding, non-destructive testing, these are, and the coating systems, these are main subjects they have to be taught. And also in our subcommittee, we should promote this software, what I have listed and I have sent it to you, try to contact them and have some sort of a webinar base. So, remote-based training program for these marine engineers. But unfortunately, there are no projects immediately coming up for them to work. If the government decides to develop Trincomalee, I think there will be a, a lot of openings providing university gives some education in that matter. So I saw a question from the Eastern University, KDU also. I think we will get together and introduce some changes to the curriculum. But there are no projects at this stage, unfortunately. Unless the new refinery comes up in Trincomalee or Ampatota, there is no more upstream. upstream. Downstream, of course, uh, LNG projects has to come up. This is what we are trying to promote now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Obesaker. And uh, then uh, we have another question, actually, uh, again, uh, pretty much related to this one, but uh, He's asking about the, could you please suggest the possible employment opportunities for the marine-based degrees in Sri Lanka and overseas? Uh, for Mr. Ravin or Dr. Kapila can explain about the overseas opportunities and then somebody from Sri Lankan industry maybe explain from our side. 
Um, okay, uh, this is Ravin. This is regarding job opportunities, is it? Yes, job opportunities for me in the student increase. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you consider like why I'm working in Singapore, um, now we are doing mega projects, you know. Uh, I would say the two leading shipyards, Semcorp Marine, uh, I mean, where I work, we have around 5 billion uh, US dollars worth of uh, projects currently in hand. Keppel Offshore Marine, our rival, has about $3 billion pro uh, uh, dollars worth of projects. The issue in Singapore is we have lack of uh, skilled manpower because we get uh, a usual, uh, because in Singapore, uh, graduates, they don't like to do the dirty jobs, you know. So we search for skilled labor currently from India, um, Bangladesh, uh, Philippines, Myanmar, China. But uh, those who come to Singapore, I'll tell you, are very qualified. They, like engineers, for example, they have degrees plus professional qualifications. If you want to get a job in Singapore, you must be qualified. Just a degree alone won't get secure a job. A degree pass out from University of Monotu or Piradin won't get a job. You need professional qualifications to adapt your CV because you are competing with other applications, highly qualified people from India, Bangladesh, Philippines, China. So it's, there's a high competition, but uh, so that's why the professional qualifications in Singapore are very critical when you uh, come here, you know. That's what we give more preference when we recruit because now everyone has a degree. So the added, in, uh, added incentive are the professional qualifications are what we are looking for. Uh, but yeah, a lot of opportunities. I mean, next year we are going to start some mega offshore projects, um, FPSOs, wind farm projects. We need a lot of manpower, uh, engineers, uh, welders, blasters, scaffolders, uh, blasters, you name it. So there should be, I think here, the Singapore High Commission, you know, the Sri Lankan High Commission in Singapore has to play a part. They have to form networks with the shipyards here where they have agencies secured in Sri Lanka who, who uh, give contacts or pass on training uh, CVs to the shipyards to, uh, to uh, get the skill manpower. Because uh, frankly speaking, uh, Pass graduate pass outs or skill uh, skill people. It's very difficult without these agencies to get jobs in Singapore. You know, uh, I, I suppose Dubai, Middle East is also same. So this is uh, qualifications are very important, but for engineers, it's not easy. Uh, your apart from a degree, you need your professional qualifications. That's critical. And for the skilled manpower, like welders, blasters, painters, scaffolders, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, hundreds, thousands of jobs still available. We need manpower at the moment to complete these projects. But uh, there should be a proper pathway where the agency in Sri Lanka coordinates with the shipyards in Singapore and helps secure the manpower uh, to get the jobs. You know, uh, India and Bangladesh are doing this great. So. Sri Lanka, this is a good opportunity where we can get foreign exchange to our country. Very, very important. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Ravin. Uh, sure, there are a few more questions. Unfortunately, with the time, we have to wind up the session. Um, so that we will again meet you in another webinar where we can clarify all of these your questions. Uh, I mean, there are follow-up uh, sessions of a webinar will be happening. So stay tuned for those webinars. Uh, so that will bring us to the end of the webinar. And on behalf of the, uh, the Skill Development Committee of the EDB, I'd like to thank all our distinguished speakers today. This webinar for taking out time for their busy schedules and sharing their interesting findings and experience with us. And we are extremely grateful for your contributions to the webinar. Also, I'd like to thank all our participants for showing their interest in the marine and offshore service sector in Sri Lanka. Your participation is highly appreciated and uh, we hope you will be joining for the future webinars as well. And to formally conclude the, uh, this webinar, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Manoja Desanayaka, Deputy Director of the Export Development Board, uh, to give the vote of thanks. Good afternoon to all. On behalf of the EDB, my sincere thank to all the participants who spent their valuable time during the two hours of time and exchange your valuable thoughts with the speakers, panelists of this webinar today. Also, I would uh, like to extend our special thank to 
the uh, all the members of uh, EDB subcommittee on skill development on marine and offshore uh, offshore industry and to give their valuable contribution to organize uh, this event successfully and uh, not only them uh, also i would like to the invited uh, professors experts of the various uh, parts of the uh, country and also the overseas and they uh, contribute their valuable uh, thoughts and information to this audience actually this webinar today discuss timely important segment and sharing information on the opportunities in marine and offshore uh, industry of sri lanka your thoughts of uh, thoughts and information related to marine industry very much was useful for country to develop sri lanka as the next source in destination in between singapore and dubai ports i believe uh, this webinar will help to uplift the knowledge on this sector for all the participants EDB is more than happy to facilitate this type of webinar and get the maximum out of this unstored opportunity to Sri Lanka economy. Before concluding this session, once again, thank you all for your participation. Thank you, Dr. Indrajit. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Indrajit. Yes. There are several questions we did not answer. Is there any way we could uh, uh, co communicate with them about uh, you know the industry? How we are? What is we are? What is our uh, plan in the future? This development, we I may think, have to. Uh, Dr. Sarat, you are, uh, Dr. Sarat, you are right because I, I capture all the questions and I put into a, a file now. Uh, oh, um, we document should file. be able so, to. Yes. We should yeah, be able I will, to. Uh, I, will, I will provide some answers to uh, Dr. Nishanka and to Sarat oh. and then we will communicate with them separately uh, in writing yes. or maybe we can get them to. Uh, yes. I think uh, the EDP them. might have their contact details so we can yeah. send them. EDP will share the, their database with your, all the panelists and the speakers. And the... Okay. Okay, then thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you EDP for yeah, the have, nice have a nice session. evening. Have a nice evening too. Thank you, Dr. Sarat. Thank you very much, everybody. I was multitasking, listening to you right throughout. Thank you very much. Excellent Bye. organization. Thank you, EDB, uh, having us for this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to going ahead. Thank you, Dr. Bye. Good night.